Manhattan West. Um, and you can see various site adjacencies that exist with respect to people versus space. So you have people coming in through Penn Station and Moynihan Station, as well as the High Line and Hudson Yards, whereas freight entered through Lincoln Tunnel, the gateway project that connects New Jersey to Penn Station. And there's an existing postal facility called Morgan Postal Facility that has existing uh, truck loading docks um, on its base. Thus, the farm is, uh, consists of a table farm which is based heavily rooted at um, uh, the current uh, existing infrastructure around the area with um, the uh, crown being for the future delivery systems of um, uh, goods and packages, um, with the base um, being uh, larger so that it can have uh, more storage and for the heavier goods, whereas the crown being for more uh, of a delivery system of small packages. Um, the way in which goods move throughout this building now is where you have a central distribution core that is meant for express delivery of packages, um, along which you have these local cores that programmatic cores that latch onto it. These local program cores, um, they send packages between these program areas and they communicate with the express core to send goods um, in and out for the program spaces. Um, the program spaces for this site specifically, uh, as mentioned earlier, the base and the crown would be dedicated for storage and distribution. Um, and um, the ground condition would, um, would allow for people to access in and around the area connecting the High Line to Moynihan Basin. Um, there is a portion that is dedicated to a uh, research that an education, the research portion of it would be almost serving as a control center that would drive all of this automation and how goods are sorted and organized, whereas the education portion would be um, in order, uh, would work in tension with the research in order to get um, people to understand the system better and to help get move this into a more efficient system of working. Um, the incubator workspaces um, are meant for small businesses to come in and to grow their businesses with this infrastructure where they would be able to send goods to their customers efficiently and bring their goods in so that would help them grow their businesses. The residential area is dedicated for small, um, uh, for long-term and short-term leases. Um, and um, as we're seeing today as well in the current situation that we're in as uh, people, we rely so much on uh, goods and packages coming to us through this e-commerce means. And um, thus you can see how in a residential portion of it would be very helpful in New York City. Along its verticality as well, you can see that there are um, various uh, public atriums which are meant for shared um, spaces as well as several uh, drone landing docks, especially dedicated to the crown of the building and the portion that is dedicated for the incubator workspaces. Um, a little bit about the structure also along its verticality, it is uh, broken up into various structural packages um, with cell shot systems and mega columns. Um, this, in this section, you can see those various layers that I was highlighting earlier where you have um, as the base, you have um, the high line, you have um, rail coming in, which brings in a uh, freight into uh, the building. Um, on top of that, you have the trucks that are bringing in freight from the Lincoln Tunnel and people that enter through the high line and five, the five Manhattan, well, uh, my, five Manhattan West Plaza uh, that connects and brings people into the building. Um, this is um, the ground level lobby plan. So as you can see, there's a major connection between the High Line and Moynihan Station, whereas um, the, the, the hive is almost forming, is filling the High Line to form this plaza out here that connects the two uh, major points. Um, and you can see that the freight is also passing through the Gateway Project right through the site. And each program space has its own dedicated lobby and entrance um, into the spaces. Um, this is an aerial shot of that site plan. Um, and just a little bit about the structural package. As I mentioned earlier, that throughout its verticality, it's split into these structural packages. Um, so as a studio, we went to with our professors, um, the structure. And um, so how it works in this case is where um, 
uh, you have a central cause with um, mega columns and secondary columns and bell trusses that for this package, the floor, subsequent floors below would be supported in um, tension, whereas the floors above would be supported through compression. Um, and the way in which the plan works is where in gray, you can see these would be the local um, program specific distribution costs. The ones in red would highlight the service and circulation costs. So as you can see, the form is almost serving as where you have these scores that are offset each other. So almost um, creating a kit of parts that support each other and the program spaces on feed off of this central core that exists. You can see that a bit better out here in the incubator workspace floor plan. You can see where you have your packages moving in this express cause and you have a local call that's constantly communicating into the office space as well as the central express call um, in this floor plan. And offset of that is where you have the program space. So I'm going to break down a bit uh, how the packages move throughout this building. Um, so looking at the base, the mid-level program, and the crown specifically as the major points of movement for packages. Um, so at the base, you have automated trucks and subway carry-ons that bring goods into the building. They are then um, um, managed through an automated control center, and um, you have automated carton um, single item picking services that move the goods into um, an automated pallet transportation that stores and distributes the goods. You, you can see this a bit better out here where you have inbound freight coming through the rails and inbound freight coming through the trucks on this end. Um, you have a, a loading dock and a sorting area that then divides the goods into high bay pallet storage systems or shuttle storage systems, which is meant for small load packages. This, these sorted goods are then sent into um, either outbound into the city or they're sent into the central cause primarily through the express core and the various local programmatic cores that send it into the program spaces. You also have outbound trade that leaves through the subway carry-on lines um, that connect back to Penn Station and uh, some automated trucks if needed. Um, now looking at the mid-level area, it, is, it works in a similar way where you have an automated control center that sorts the goods. You have your single item picking and you have the pallets. So you can see that out here. So this is looking at a major sorting floor in the mid-level incubator workspace where you can see that the local core serves um, for in outbound goods, which is brought from the base into the program um, spaces. These program spaces that can then communicate with the express cause by sending goods into the sorting floor, which then um, send goods out in, through the express core to the crown of the building or the base of the building, depending on the load and how heavy it is. Um, so now I'm gonna tell you about how the goods and packages leave the building at the crown. So it works in a similar way, although it's the process is flipped where you have your automated pallet transportation and your, these robotic arms that pick the goods out and they put them into the control center, which then sends a drone out of the building to deliver these goods. So as you can see, you have the sorting floor as well and, um, at the crown um, that then um, sends goods into the drones to send, out, to send them out into the cityscape or to bring goods in. And you have uh, drone parking areas as well. So this allows the crown to almost start to become a spectacle on the skyline. So you can see that in this shot as well. It's um, a drone's eye view. So you're observing the crown as the spectacle of constant movement and um, of packages constantly leaving and entering the building and um, feeding the space. Um, a little bit about the curtain walls. So um, it consists of um, shading mechanism as well as on certain of those public atrium spaces. You can see that it has green walls and this drone landing docks is opening. Um, and in order to power um, and get solar energy, it also consists of solar panels along its sub edges and um, on some portions of the curtain wall in order to receive en solar energy in order to help drive these automated pallet systems. Um, and this is a, um, a render that shows that plaza level, as mentioned earlier, that um, connecting the High Line um, and Five Manhattan West to almost fill out and create this courtyard. 
And as you can see, um, the core in some ways and the packages are almost revealed in a way so that this building, it's not, um, although it's blending with and trying um, to um, um, be transparent, it's also um, trying to show that the building is serving um, for these packages and that it has like pick up stations at the ground level so that people can come and pick up goods from this um, infrastructure. Um, this is a bone's eye view. So seeing from the railways, looking back up at the base being that they put edge that's really rooted down and the crown that's that spectacle with the constant um, inward and outward movement of drones. Um, and this is again the public plaza, so really revealing the rails that bring in the goods and take them out. And again, you can see the revealed packages at the core and the ground level. So it's letting the people and informing the people of what this building is standing for. Um, and this is just a diagnostic data and elevation of what it would stand like. Um, and how it's really rooting down into the ground and the crown being that spectacle and how the packages in some moments are revealed. Um, and this is how in the nighttime it could um, it could so that um, it, as um, illuminating the, the, the processes that it functions for. And um, yeah, so that's the hive. I guess I would, uh, can I start? Sorry guys, I'm working on the tablet for sound and it's not cooperating. Rhea, one thing that worked very well this morning was to show on your screen um, the thumbnails on the left side of all okay. your drawings. So yeah, that's, that's a good, good idea. To it. Okay, yeah. Um, could I start? Can, can I kick it off? Please. Well, I, I guess I would just say that uh, just want to commend you for the thoroughness of uh, you know pursuing the 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 goals that you have this one line of thought and and taking it through almost um, excessively through the whole system um, and so I think it's very appealing the, this idea that you're proposing it's very interesting what I'm surprised at is actually how conventional in terms of the aesthetics for this high-rise building, um, how conventional it, it looks. In other words, it doesn't try to, um, in a way, portray or reveal what's going on or what the building is about, which is really the driving force that you have with your, uh, your whole narrative and your conversation. I was wondering if you might want to talk about that a little bit. Um, so, um, with respect to um, the way um, it is displayed as, um, so looking at the site context as well, it's trying to, um, so in a way, when we think of industrial buildings, we always think of them as being hidden or as um, these systems that are very jarring, but in order for them to fit into the urban scape and to work with everyday lives and um, especially inside of a building in order for them to be able to function with existing um, like incubator workspaces or residential there needs to be some level of transparency versus spaces that hide them so that's why in certain moments um, along it you have moments where it is revealed but in some places where it um, does not um, so in a way, it's trying to speculate what the future could be like and how a system like this could work in our everyday lives and how we exist, which is why it um, is displayed as this. Right, but I guess what I'm getting at is that if you just showed me the renderings of your building, I would not have necessarily put that narrative that you just went through and applied it to them it's not you haven't taken and i'm not saying that's right or wrong but i would just like to hear from you specifically why you would go one way or the other because 
you know, you haven't taken the approach of say like this Pompidou Center, for example, just to go back to a classic, right? Where the systems of the building, that's the narrative about it. And, uh, and they are on display and they are the facade. And that's what you first notice and see uh, because they're exposed and they're in color. Then they have the whole experience of the building as well. And, um, you know, debatable whether it fits or doesn't fit in Paris, that was a whole story that was the cause for a lot of uproar. But, um, um, but now it does, right? Now we've embraced it. And um, so your, your building doesn't really take a stand that way. It's kind of assumes that in the future, our skyscrapers will look the way that we currently know them. The aesthetics are dictated by the structure that we currently know. And there is, um, at least in my opinion, I, I don't really see a position to like turning inside out or revealing really the ambition of, of uh, and the driving force of your project in forming the aesthetic. It's like, it's, it's hidden inside the bowels of, of this building. You wouldn't guess that it's, that's what it's about. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Oh, sorry. So you know, I was I'll just pick up on the aesthetic thing. Obviously, there's been a whole amazing history in, in architecture where the speculative tower gets the speculative aesthetic. You know, from Saint Elia, I mean, forward that you actually envision a future scenario, but you also have to begin to kind of champion some future version of what it could look like that begins to kind of open up a way that uh, it communicates the public. And obviously, the tower it has a, a whole degree of functionality that it has to kind of deal with but it also has to communicate to the public about uh, its kind of, it is as a symbol in the city also. I mean, I'm actually, so think, I mean, the project is, is, is F, obviously opens up an important question for all of us um, in terms of the kind of, uh, the way that we think of new, a layer of, 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 of a transportation system in the future, which was probably en route. But for me, actually, I'm left with like two big questions and I think it's important. One is ethical and one is technical. technical. But in the ethic, the ethic front, are you arguing that we need a new era of consumerism, that your tower will literally usher in a new way for us to consume faster, to actually produce, consume more things faster? Is that, is that the kind of like the core of the argument of the project? Because then I, I just, I have some, some big ethical question I wanna put on the table in front of the jury. If that is like at the end, what the ultimate goal of your project would be? So I think uh, the project primarily is reacting to um, trends of e-commerce. It isn't necessarily um, moving towards where um, we want to be consuming. Um, we want to be uh, reacting to so much consumption, but it's just trying to serve as a point um, of entry of goods into the city more efficiently because yeah. it's trying to, um, in a way, um, re, uh, re, re um, make the infrastructure networks and the way in which packages and goods enter into the city more efficient. It's reacting to um, the heavy reliance of Manhattan area specifically on Less shops mile. and how unsustainable that is. Yeah. I'm completely, I completely agree. I mean, the last mile literally introduces basically an env environmental catastrophe. That literally the last mile with all of the stop trucks, all of the emissions, you, you can do the calculus for that. It literally, it costs the city a lot of money in total like decrease in productivity, environmental pollution, it's massive. But I do think your project can push further in thinking about if you're actually, every infrastructure that is taking up public space, you're talking about mass amount of packages that are actually flying through the air in New York City. That's public space. You actually have to make an argument for me about the nature of how your project will be rewarding the public. Not in a consumerist type of narrative, but you're actually, the New York City subway, the streets of New York give back to the city. They're actually a public infrastructure. And if you're actually taking the skies of New York City, you have to give back a question of the public. And I think that's where you can actually leverage the programmatic idea of your tower. So for example, if you're actually asking packages to come into your tower very, very quickly, you can increase the speed of research exponentially. Like certain scientists demand samples to do research. If you can actually promise that we can actually do research in a radically different way because of package delivery, 
if you can actually say that each of those programs in tower actually leads to a revolutionary way of thinking of type of research of type of living then i think you have a stronger argument than just the sheer consumerist argument because i think you need at this point we need to kind of push the project to a place that is beyond consumerism I, yeah i mean i i agree about that i mean it's interesting um you know, like if, if you if you own a drone, um, like as, as I do, it has to be registered. Um, and recently, uh, the U.S. government just put out a uh, an RFI to eight major companies uh, in the U.S. Airbus, AirMap, Amazon, Intel, OneSky, Skyward, T-Mobile, um, and one last one. And and basically, what they're going to start to do is ask um, these companies to research how we um, start to um, have remote identification programs for these drones. So it's kind of a reality right now that I think our government's gearing up for this type of um, infrastructure. So it's, it's, a, it's a beautifully um, you know, appropriate uh, timed project. Um, and maybe I'll just speak to a couple things, right? Um, and one, it, it does have to do with the aesthetics and I'll pick up um, from the last comment, but I also think it has to do with something functional. Like um, there's a couple of really interesting things. And I think that, you know, those would push up against the, the, the kind of the look of the building and the functionality of the building. So for example, um, you know, drones are very sensitive to wind um, and they operate uh, at a, they consume more energy when it's windy. Uh, for for example, so I think you know to to kind of reimagine um, how a facade uh, could take those you know instead of having bottlenecks at the top you know where things are coming in and out at the same place, if you can kind of rethink the facade as a, a place where things come in at all the entire level things come in um, and you know for instance these kind of vehicles uh, could be charged. Um, and they could slowly make their way up to the top when they're, you know, then uh, offloaded and reloaded and fully charged and then deployed. Um, so I think there's also, you know, some fundamental things to question the, the kind of slabbing or the horizontality that traditionally are found within um, these big skyscrapers. So it has like enormous potential there. Uh, just to rethink that typology, um, but you have to kind of play out some of the realities of, of the, the type of delivery um, uh, and infrastructure that these um, unmanned vehicles need. So your facade would absolutely, I think, change. It would be more porous. It might have areas, uh, small areas to land, and then, you know, these things could be picked up on a, on a belt and then charged, and by the time they get to the top, they you know, they, they could deploy again. But then I also think there's another, you know, amazing ability here to, to integrate systems. Like, you know, um, you have this, if you have this massive vertical um, space, you know, there's something that's called the stack effect, which brings um, kind of air and filters it up. So you already get these like beautiful updrafts inside the interior. Um, so, and then I, then I also think about, um, you know, you need to think more about the machine vision of these things and how they're going to view the world. And, you know, a lot of the machine vision includes um, identifying things through edges. Um, I don't know if you saw the second to last Westworld um, episode, but uh, they have this like amazing scene where the drone's coming in, it's like finding all the edges and then it's navigating through the space. So imagine now that you have to create, um, you know, a facade that's going to receive in multiple enter points the incoming uh, vehicles, um, and they're going to have to understand how to, to view, to find their place. Um, you know, so it, it needs the aesthetic, I think, has to tie with um, the functionality, but also with a new type of, of viewing things. Um, and I think understanding edges and how edges um, as an architectural detail could come into play on the facade is is also kind of a, a really interesting um, speculation. So I hope you continue to develop this project because I would imagine in the end, you know, if, if you keep following these trails, um, you'll, you'll come up with something very different, very unique um, that challenges infrastructural projects like such like the AT&T Tower, um, you know, in, in New York, that it's a, it's a strange uh, beast, you know, so to speak. And it doesn't, 
you know, necessarily say screams I'm a data center or screams I'm a long lines building, mm -hmm. but it's something unique and different. We look at it in a different way. It has a different presence in the city. Um, so that's the kind of power of this building. And it's, it's no longer, I think, um, a uh, kind of a science fiction future. It's our reality right now. And we're desperately um, needing uh, young minds to think about this and really, really reinvent um, the typology. So think a little, think more radically with this uh, amazing proposal that you have put forth. Um, just a foot, a footnote to your comment. There, there's Philip Techman who's a past faculty, Pratt faculty member. If you look at his studies, Philip Techman, he did an amazing set of tower studies about like really thinking energetically about the thermodynamic performance of towers and literally changing literally micro environments in thinking about the this chimney effect, but radically rethinking how you can get energy from point A to point B in a much faster and kind of interesting way. And it will lead, it, again, it leads to a very different kind of aesthetic and performance. Yeah, and okay, so I think one last thing I was gonna say is, you should look at um, these kind of very beautiful uh, Venetian birdhouses uh, that were made, um, you know, when when Venice was ruling the, the road. But you'll find them on islands all throughout uh, that type of um, that infrastructural Silk Road, where you know the, their houses made normally, but the walls are permeable and they're they're beautiful because of it, and they're strange. So. It's like the, the permeability, I think, really needs to be rethought as well. I think one of, the, one of the things that really comes to mind for me about this is that, so you've got a mixed use building. So it's, it's unsure whether the aesthetic wants to be infrastructure or if it wants to be glass tower, which is kind of nondescript um, or doesn't really have kind of an identity to it. So I'd echo pretty much what everybody else is saying here is kind of needing to amplify that or have some sort of dialogue between the mixed use elements and the infrastructure elements. Like part of me wants to see, you know, the mixed use um, almost like, a, you know, a series of parasites on the outside of this infrastructural element, which is all about connection and movement to the city um, as kind of a lifeline to the city. So in addition to that, I think almost the overall form of it needs to reach out a lot more. Like I feel like when you're looking at the shape of the building, all I can really do to tell that drones are going into that is actually see the image of the drones in the rendering. And there's something about it where I feel like that building needs to reach out. It needs to be able to, to put its hands out, to act as if it's kind of tentacles to different parts of the city so that you have a visual sense that things are coming in and out of that. It's connecting in all sorts of different ways. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to play up that aesthetic and the difference between the different program elements. Um, I would also think, in general, the use of materiality concerns me a little bit because it also sits in between whether it wants to be a glass tower or a piece of infrastructure. I mean, that AT&T tower is a, an example. There's a couple of other buildings like that where it's got that more massive stone or concrete feel in terms of how it's attached to the base. But in your case, it's a mix between that and the glass towers that we get next to our Hudson Yards. And I think there's an opportunity to take on that conversation about the aesthetic of infrastructure and the aesthetic of what is modern infrastructure in a city now. Um, I think it could be actually something quite a bit different. So I, I would just say to echo what a number of you saying, even Danielle specifically, um, taking it up a few more notches in terms of how intensely you think about that dialogue between each of these different programmatic, programmatic elements. And I think you will actually end up with something that is a very unique looking typology. Thank you. But I think that the that the just to circulate um, everything that's uh, uh, kind of uh, previous critics have said. I think the question here is the nature of the radicality, and and I think if you kind of look back historically at the other juncture points that we found ourselves in, uh, you know, you take Le Corbusier for example. He was not the first architect to realize that cars were going to have a presence. He wasn't, you know, didn't obviously invent the car or anything. But I think that he crystallized an understanding of how cars and automobile travel was going to transform the city. Like or hate what he did, he kind of nailed it on the head that, that the implications of the vehicle weren't just about accommodating it in a carport, but that you radically rethink distance, the shape of cities, and so on. And, and you know, I mean, he, he, and he kind of, in that case, he kind of nailed it. Um, and then as cities started to kind of negotiate with the automobile, you had Louis Kahn's plan for, for Philadelphia. 
And again, he started to rethink how it is that you actually get uh, cars to be a, a force for densification rather than just de-densification, right? So that they give another paradigm that we can all talk about. And again, it was a speculative project. So I, I think that what, what the other critics are searching for here, and I just want to kind of focus, is not necessarily um, radicalness in terms of the form, as in just make something that looks like different because it's for boxes as opposed to people. But I think that what we're all sort of uh, wrestling with right now, I think this is a very kind of current thing, especially in an environment where we're all sitting home getting boxes basically delivered to us, um, is what are the implications going to be on building form and on urban form when there is a reintegration of basically, you know, manufacturing and distribution back into the city. And, you know, it's interesting you're citing because the building next door to you is basically built over those rail tracks because it was originally a warehousing building. Further down the high line, you know, you have what's now the Google headquarters. Those were all loft buildings. And so the, lo the loft on the one hand doesn't seem like a very radical typology. On the other hand, this idea that you want to be within a few blocks of where the ships come in, but it's also a manufacturing facility. You can make fabric. A lot of these things also doubled as wholesale stores and actual stores, you know, department stores and so on. That sort of sort of multivalent flexibility, I think, is something that we are still finding opportunities within those typologies today, which is you know why tech companies like Google might come in. So I think the question is, if you are finding new ways of using whether it's drone technologies or elevator or packaging to, to re-centralize in, in an urban location, what are the implications for the tower form that are radical in, in how they subvert what we have to deal with now when towers are all about just people? And also what are then, what are then the sort of implications for the urban form around it? Right. This is the kind of seed of something that changes what's what's ha what's happening, what's happening um, around it. So I, I would I would encourage you to, to, you know, obviously you can always have fun with form, but to really think in terms of typology and program, what what does this allow you to to change going forward? Thank you. Hi. Um... One thing I found really successful and interesting about the project that maybe speaks to some of these comments was your investigation into the core. Um, and I, you know, you went through it pretty quickly and I couldn't get quite a kind of close read on exactly what was going on with it. But it felt like therein um, was a kind of like nugget that indicated uh, that maybe this project doesn't want to be a novel tower, but could actually be conceived as a kind of way of retrofitting existing buildings um, to become more friendly towards this new infrastructure. Um, because, you know, I don't want to keep repeating the same comments over and over again, but uh, of course I, I do share this idea that it seems a shame to put all this amazing research to kind of reproducing the image of a tower that we've already seen or some version thereof. Um, but I think that when I look at your core and especially actually if you can go to the plan, um, I think you had some like diagrammatic plans that were kind of like neoclassical in their form. Um, they were little like stars uh, that were at the center of the building. I think actually where your project is the most exciting is in reintroducing a kind of formal party or organizing principle to a tower through the kind of redesign of a core, um, which could then kind of alleviate a new ground plane at the ground level, which I think would work really well with your project. I mean, one of the kind of latent ideas you're coming up with is that by reorienting infrastructure to the sky via these drones, maybe we could actually leave the ground plane to become more of a public amenity rather than like something that has to negotiate front of house and back of house, for example. Um, and so I, I would I would sort of understand your project in these two trajectories. Like on the one hand, I think there's maybe a slightly less compelling version of a new tower just because of, of the kind of aesthetic problem. Um, but I think there's a really compelling way that you're thinking through organization and the potentials that that have uh, on a, a city, both you know, in the way infrastructure is deployed in the sky, in the middle of the building and on the ground, and what that means in terms of how the building itself operates. So I wanna commend you for that and say that I think that maybe if we were to, to kind of read the project, um, maybe as a retrofit project, for example, um, it's a really kind of interesting way of, of thinking about how cities have to adapt right now. So I think great work in that regard. Thank you. And it uh, does tie to the to Danielle's comment. I mean, obviously, the the question that, of how to really rethink air. Uh, there's a whole history of architecture of pneumatics, and if you actually really radically want to remove anything, you dish pick. You want to like remove friction as quickly as possible, and uh, not rely on mechanics. And so it means that you can actually have a core that is actually moving on a cushion of air and actually using mechanics, which is 
been used in fairly large systems before. This would be much bigger, but you can actually move packages at a much faster rate if you're using that. And so the idea of actually radically rethinking core, the center of it based on air, and then the envelope itself and rethinking a whole way between aerodynamics and thermodynamics, you can actually literally allow a whole different way that air is managed throughout the, the center of the building and the perimeter, which would lead to a, a pretty radically different tower uh, and a, a way of thinking of infrastructure. I mean, for me, one thing too, is that this would be opening literally a new infrastructure. And with every new infrastructure, there's types of infrastructure and then there's critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure are types of infrastructure that are become essential to the functioning of cities and states and they're controlled by national security. They're, they're different actually. And your project, your project might go from one infrastructure to becoming a really essential infrastructure, which is really interesting. And it does have a lot of potential in that way. But then you would actually have to demand back to Kathy's point, you'd actually have to demand that you'd have some position also on security. Uh, there would actually, you would have to be like, from a national security position, your project is like, ah, it's crazy having a swarm of potential threats that you would actually have to think about a strategic positioning uh, pretty differently actually. Um, and so that's again, again, another whole other way of thinking about your project about where it's valuable in terms of plugging into infrastructure, but then also like what it does when it becomes infrastructure in a strategic uh, relationship to the rest of the city. Yeah, I also just want to add, um, in addition to the kind of uh, the previous comments regarding technology, functionalism, and the kind of the reconsideration of typology and the aesthetics a little bit, I guess one thing that I think that that you, your project really uh, kind of poses is kind of like because of the the demand for uh, for this kind of logistic space urbanly, that there there needs to be a redistribution of human spaces and non-human spaces that traditionally exist in a tower topology vertically, right? So um, if we think about that for a second, that traditionally that, you know, a tower is usually demand, um, designed for perhaps 70% 70, 70 uh, human spaces and 30% um, machine spaces or non-human spaces that as a, as, a, as a mean to sort of augment one kind of environment. But in this case that that it's kind of completely flipped. So what does it mean for the kind of the climatic condition that happens within this, uh, this, this tower? What does it mean for the kind of a structural and tectonic system that that's kind of happens in this tower? In a sense that, for example, I'm looking at this kind of the, um, the kind of the, the, the cutaway drawing that it seems to be, seems to me that the kind of the stacking of the goods, the stacking of the kind of the, the stuff itself demands sort of a new kind of way in thinking about how structure and how sort of how items uh, kind of physically and structurally relate to each other that is perhaps different from the kind of the typical um, the floor slabs and the column system that uh, you're showing us here. So I'm, I'm not going to comment too much because I said it on the, on the original review of this. Um, I will say that, you know, it feels like a lot of what people have said were, you know, brought up in the, in the original review about the form and, or what it looks like and like the impact on the city. The one thing that listening to some of them, some of the people's comments about the hive and like where all the stuff comes up with is I wonder if, did you think about if this thing wouldn't have been, uh, would not have been like a central tower and more like decentralized? And would that have operated? Maybe there have been some benefits to that as a network. It feels like centralizing and central planning something and bringing so much into one spot, there might have been uh, a different approach to scattered or, or uh, moving these things about the city. And also, if you would have had more time, it would have been really amazing to see an animation of how this building works. Because when I was a year ago, when I was at a brick plant in Nebraska, looking at how they operated and, and they made their brick, like the, the thinking and like the movement of stuff 
throughout their entire plant. And even though their plant was just a shell, like we, like all distribution centers are, if you would take the Amtrak from here to DC, all the trucking distributions are just a generic piece of shell and all the stuff goes on inside of them. So it would have been, if we would have had more time, it would have been really amazing to kind of see your, your building move and operate as a, as a, as a thing. But, um, you know, I enjoyed your project because I sat through it in the original time around. So congratulations for all the work and effort you put in on it. Thank you. Hi, this one is other thing I just um, want to bring up. I just up wanted to I, add that um, I just sorry, want to commend you on like, I think aesthetically and graphically, it's very clear. One thing I was actually um, interested in knowing is whether or not I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming this is part of your previous deck on research, but Grimaza Kohler was never really referenced. Um, but I think that would have been a really great interest in kind of understanding how um, drones are a big part of it. I feel like past couple of weeks or just past semester, I've been looking at a lot of drone type projects. And <laughs> this is actually an interesting representation of it. Um, and just like a couple of days ago, I was uh, at a CCA one that talked about drone delivery. And I, I resonate so much of what um, Danielle uh, mentioned about the delivery and, it, and also what Samuel was saying about decentralizing the tower space, because that would actually uh, celebrate not only the formal aspect of your building, but it could also contribute to how the, the, the functional um, aspects and programmatically reorganize uh, how humans interact with uh, androids. So I think one, one aspect of that is um, what is missing, maybe for your portfolio, maybe not now, is uh, are, are more kind of studies on the, the human and one-on-one uh, -on -one level. I think that'll be, a, and aesthetically, I think you won't have an issue on that. I think urban, you've already zoomed out so well. Um, there are certain elements that you could actually connect the story that you're trying to tell in a more intimate moments of how people are interacting with the machine itself. I think that'll be very successful. Either it's a zoom in or a fly through, or even, you know, if you just want to execute that as like a storyboard, I think those kind of in intimate moments would really kind of start uh, elevating your project on the delivery of um, how people are interacting with the drone. So that, that's something you might want to celebrate within your portfolio. Um, and it's just a suggestion, but like I commend you on, on the graphics. It's, it's really well done. I think Wendy's suggestion is a really great one. And I'm, I'm struck, Wendy, by the, um, the series of diagrams. I'm trying to remember the name of the professor. He did it in conjunction with um, appliance companies about the American kitchen and what was the most efficient arrangement of how appliances. Because remember, the kitchens and houses used to be big rooms, right, for when everything was sort of done by hand. And as appliances came in, the way we work in a galley kitchen or L-shaped kitchen, these incredibly narrow spaces that we can do everything in, is really a result actually of changing technology. And it's a microcosm version of that. But I think injecting the human scale um, into these spaces in a kind of similar way, and I'm just I'm thinking of that kind of mode of representation, Wednesday, Wendy, maybe that's what you have in mind, would just be, would, would be transformative and, and maybe might give you the vehicle to transforming the form of the tower so it's a little bit less uh, normative because it's being based, the form would adapt to how it is that we, we use the spaces within the tower. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Well, um, uh, thank you to all the jurors for this one. Um, the point I actually want to make is that for all these kids, it's actually pretty miraculous that they got to this point. Um, on March 11th, we were told to more or less vacate the building right before um, right before vacation. And uh, most of them had to leave behind models and a lot of stuff that they probably could have used for the last, next, last few weeks. Um, but we're very, very proud of Rhea. She's worked very hard from the beginning. She provoked a fabulous discussion with everyone and I thank everyone for that. Um, very good job, Rhea. We're, Michael and I are both very proud of you. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Nice work. Yeah, thank you. Great work. Thank you. Congratulations. So um, we're smoothly sliding into the um, second presentation here for the afternoon. Um, 
Uh, Professor Karen Bowser and I uh, also teach a section of degree project, and uh, we uh, teach alongside uh, Saul Anton, which I'm not sure if he's in on this uh, session here today. He is our writing support uh, and also our kind of critic at large. Uh, and between the three of us, um, we uh, conducted a course that was focused on the notion that um, uh, form and composition still play a preeminent role in the um, uh, uh, in the battle to advocate for ideas within the, the kind of cultural realm at large through building. Uh, our section is called the Contemporary Society and the Architectural Object. It is intentionally vague in order to make plenty of room for the, the degree of variety that we expect every term, uh, being that the projects are um, uh, uh, coordinated by the students uh, based on their um, uh, interest in a certain part of the world, perhaps a certain program, and most certainly um, in their interest in certain kinds of um, compositional, uh, certain kinds of approaches to architectural composition. Uh, as exemplified by a form study that we had everybody uh, conduct in the, uh, the first part of their spring semester. Um, the, um, uh, the class, uh, 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 obviously, um, the interruption in the spring uh, was uh, was uh, quite a shock to everybody. Um, one of the tenets that characterizes our approach over the six years we've been teaching this course is that uh, um, to really get at an idea, a compositional idea that could drive an architectural project into the territory, it's important that one um, start that uh, uh, process by thinking through making. Uh, and so, uh, physical product is an important part of our formula traditionally. Um, that being said, uh, this is the project you're going to see here today. Um, uh, you know, Karen and I look for projects that uh, press the uh, the core issue of how form relates to architectural expression and cultural advocacy in architecture um, to its, its extremes. Uh, and uh, uh, as a way of not only advancing a conversation about the project itself and the terms that uh, uh, were in the students' research, but also about architecture at large. And I definitely think you'll find this is one of those projects that pushes that question quite far indeed. Was it about me? Um, I thought that was a fabulous um overview and introduction to the project. And I just want to uh, invite the guest critics to luxuriate in some of the physical models that this team was able to produce before we vacated the building. They're, uh, in our opinion, quite stunning and a great way for them to launch into their, their, virtual, um, their virtual studio work. So Susie, Tyler, please take it away. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tyler. And uh, hi, I'm Susie. And this is now playing. Uh, the abandoned site of the defunct Flushing Airport is now a curious green void in the midst of Flushing, Queens. It's remained undeveloped since the facility was decommissioned and demolished in, 18, in 1984. The size of the site presents a unique opportunity to break from the surrounding precedent of big box developments with their expansive parking lots and soften the quality of the neighborhood by preserving some of the site's green space. In an interest of setting a new precedent for the area, we're proposing a building that resides in the midst of the field and engages with the land and its rules under circumstances that suggest the building and the site are integrated whole. We are responsive to the enduring nature of buildings and their transient relationship to program. Um, here's our site in relation to Manhattan and LaGuardia Airport with Jamaica Bay to the north. Uh, most of the time the site is experienced while driving down the Whitestone Expressway as the ash dump adjacent to the New York Times Distribution Center. Um, since the Flushing Airport was abandoned in the mid 80s, this patch has largely reverted back to wetland um, and the previous infrastructure of this airport um, has been claimed by nature and is now in a position to be engaged. The site is an inexplicable heap of ash and marsh in a thoroughly developed context. Uh, Tyler, if you want to, okay. Uh, it is shown uh, by massive commercial buildings shown in pink with housing to the south and suburban homes to the north. Uh, shown in yellow are the residential buildings surrounding the site. 
The the site is uh, also accompanied by the presence of a large bird watching community, um, making it pseudo rural. The site is eclectic and it sets up uh, it sets itself up as a field of play. So our research in the fall centered around how the field and the rules of play could be engraved could be embraced collectively as a society. We explored how communication can be fostered through the blurring of these game fields and rules. Further, we saw how play externalizes communication through movements and landscapes. Uh, whether it be an ambiguous surrealist board game or the practice of video game modding. Uh, we saw how the layering, breaking, and entangling of these rules and movements can, can create a meaningful dialogue between players and observers. The relationship between play, performance, and rituals was integral to our research, with ritual having the potential to serve as the interface between play and buildings. Um, what are the rule sets of a ritual? In the beginning of the semester, we began creating formal studies, as John and Karen mentioned previously, um, based on the manipulation of existing geometric rule sets. And more importantly, we're embracing the infrastructural elements that came along with them. Uh, stage one evolved into a recontextualizing process where we recodified and collaged foreign and familiar elements um, that were then creating new and novel arrangements. These collage pieces reacted to a gray base geometry and then began reacting against themselves. These studies embrace finished quality and industrial resolution at an early stage. And while the found rule sets blur, new ones are navigated. Uh, the forms also lend themselves well to being literally collaged. Uh, the collages can be read plannerly as new fields of play and landscapes. While the earlier studies were cited in the observer's hand, they matured here by reacting to a rigid site. Now this viewer becomes an occupant and observes by circulating the forms. The pieces then began reacting more dramatically with their sites. Uh, they carve away mass and propel new geometric and infrastructural relationships. The later studies also had literal moving pieces and had the ability to be activated by the viewer. Um, the interaction between us was crucial to this process as our understanding um, and the vision of the final form was constantly changing in response to the other person, um, as well as their actions and the new geometries that were added. Um, this process also supplied a playful, chaotic studio space uh, shown here, which is now missed. Our position can contribute to the development of an individual through a creative dialogue. We're creating a complex that uses these concepts of montage and collage that is conducive to the architecturally ambiguous space of a film studio. Through this utilization, we develop the massing of the complex in response to our existing site qualities and neighboring conditions. Uh, spaces shouldn't be prescribed, but played with and through. We aim for an architecture that fosters a new communication, loosens the programmatic grasp, and allows play to be considered a serious part of a functioning society and a productive lifestyle. This strong breaks down discrete levels and whimsical circulation opportunities in our complex, as well as pointing out what we call the red pieces. Our early formal studies are perspectively arranged and constructed, and we use the same logic for our mass massing, which then gets negotiated plannerly. The massings collide and internal rules imprint on one another. The last step is the perspectival I seem to have lost Tyler. Of the red geometries and so placing pieces. Hmm? I, I think you cut out for about five, 10 seconds and maybe that was just me, apologies. It could easily be me. Okay. Am I back? Yep, you're back. Keep okay. Shall I start yeah, you left off on perspectival play. Okay. The last step is the perspectival insertion of the red geometries as key infrastructural and circulatory pieces. 
Uh, there's a semblance of play itself, and we go from inside out again. Uh, the external connection of massing pieces to each other needed to be a reintegration of perspectival elements. A building's relationship to program should be looser, and the in-between is an area meant to be explored and played with. In play, language is forfeited, allowing for a nonverbal dialogue between players. When the governing rules are deranged, undisciplined play is embraced. When the field of play is blurred and the preconceptions of rules are recodified, a unique non-adversarial dialogue between players is established. Um, we propose uh, that over-programming can be remedied through an expanding superstructural approach to design, uh, one that develops an alternate programmatic paradigm where a narrative is built around structure and filigree, whether it be formal or contextual, and the building becomes both a facilitator and antagonist to form. This uh, shown right now is the first main floor plan of the complex. Um, and this is the second. Through the colliding of disparate ideas, forms can engage the imagination of an increasingly polarized public. A gratuitous building is more integrated with our conception of play and program. In some aspects, incomprehension is an appropriate destination. We've broken down the project's footprint to include 80,000 square feet of studio space, 25,000 square feet of discrete backlots, 10,000 square feet of office and storage spaces, and a ring boardwalk as a significant element for local bird watchers and to be integrated as park circulation. Shown here is the entrance where occupants are taken from their commuting rituals and are immediately filtered through. Um, to the right of that being the loading dock entrance and ramp for truck circulation to the other sound studios and the back lot. The mass highlighted uh, in the middle is for fabrication and storage in line with the loading dock. This acts as a central hub and is able to deploy sets to any studio or space in the complex. The sound stage to the right of the fabrication hub it has the ability to roll on a track up to the storage portion of this mass. In the project, non-prescribed collisions act as mediators between occupants. Uh, the mass to the left is broken up into smaller recording studios with adjacent editing bays. It's by far the mass with the most electronic infrastructure. And to the right is a large sound stage with internal and external mezzanines. And the studio to the bottom is specifically optimized for natural light and has panoramic views of both the site and the city. Uh, this is an exploded axon of root massings with infrastructure and detail underlay. Uh, these are the forms which assemble and then set off the more detailed reaction against all the geometries. The masses react to one another as well as their place in the vertical field. The layers entangle and carve away at each other and also apply infrastructure in response. Um, shown here, this is cut through the entrance filter and the long sound stage. Um, seen as also the highest patio here you can see a light studio and underneath is the birders ring. In an interesting dialogue with the site in our section quality um, has also turned, oh, sorry. Um, here you can see the interesting part is that it, the sections are starting to um, become one with the marsh as it rises and falls, sometimes having a tree or two peeking out um, this being cut through the recording studio and entrance atrium, and then a red circulation piece um, onto the fabrication mass. This is an elevation with some codified volumes embracing kit-like representation. Uh, this is our project within the landscape. Uh, the programmatic rules of the airport have been redefined by, made, by nature. What was tarmac and runway has developed into fields of brush and rising bodies of water. What was left over from that is now forest. By reacting to the natural elements on the site, we're reacting to the lost rules of the airport. 
As mentioned before, non-prescribed collisions act as mediators between occupants. The way people circulate through the complex takes into consideration the obligations of various occupants programs while still being as non-prescriptive as possible. Here we see the, it's a little laggy. Uh... All right, there we go. Uh, here we see the discrete fact lot space, which provides an opportunity to shoot outdoors, is located directly behind the fabrication hub and connects to the main circulation walkways. The current presence of the birdwashing community in the site presents opportunities for the project to embrace the unique qualities of the site. Um, here we see the boardwalk, which circulates through the marsh um, located under the sound studios. Uh, this being a production office facing the Whitestone Expressway to the east. The, um, and this is the boardwalk from before. It wraps around as well as it supports the uh, light studio above. Um, and here on the horizon, we're able to see that our site, um, the side of our site that's neighboring the Whitestone Expressway. Thank you for playing. Welcome to the jury for comments. It's a lot to take in the the you know the, the quantity of the visuals and how many of them are, are are quite stunning. Just like you know, I mean, you, you could you could get lost in slide twenty four or twenty five for a very long time. <laughs> I think I think you know it, it, it's interesting. Um, this is sort of the final review season. As I've kind of gone from you know different reviews online, which are the projects or, or studios that seem to transition pretty well to sort of Zoom review, and which are the ones you just wish, you know, John, that you'd have like 24 by 36 of these drawings printed out so you could just sort of stand and peruse them at your heart's content, and 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 you know while you, while you kind of figure out like what insights you want to contribute. I, I think the thing that I'm I'm struck by, and I just <clears throat> I'm just saying this to start the conversation, and it's really more than question than, than an answer or, or an idea is what the relationship between formal play as in process, as in you are playing, is between, uh, is to play as in the process by which an occupant plays. And what I mean by that is a lot of times the things that look easiest are actually hardest, right? Like the, 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 when somebody does something that looks easy there's a great deal of work that goes into it so a lot of times the business of fun is not actually fun right it's you know like if you if you ever ever uh had any good friends or comedians or worked with them they're actually like it's work right they hone their jokes they try them six different ways they make sure that that placement of a word is, is funny or you know enjoyable more than another one and they just keep doing it over and over again until they can also deliver the joke without laughing right like it's no longer funny to them it's it's, it's work and so as I'm going through here, there's a lot of, um, you know, opportunistic moments of beautiful virtuosity where, where, where mechanistic things have kind of collided together. And I wouldn't say it's accidental because obviously you guys worked at this over and over again until you developed a lexicon of moves that enabled you to predict with some regularity how it was that you could get certain spatial features. Like, like the, you, you rely in your sculptures pretty consistently on a play of you know circular forms against L or J shaped forms that then can can um, intersect with straight forms, and you avoid at almost all costs circular forms hitting straight forms without kind of some mediating device. Like it's just that that's your like a little lexicon thing. But I'm just trying to figure out how that is obviously you guys having fun with the assembly of the pieces. And I guess I'm trying to figure out, and I just I don't have an answer to the question, but maybe maybe you do, maybe the other critics do, how you can then know with specificity that that what is fun to make is creating within the way that people would occupy or work through this thing something fun for them to do and that's maybe a question to you guys to start with and, and maybe to the other, the other critics but i think it's i think it's kind of um kind of implicit in the 
in, in the precept of the argument you guys set up, you know, early, especially, you know, again, the diagrams at page uh, 26, but then also some of the kind of, you know, early kind of, kind of form, formal studies. Well, I mean, I, I guess that's, um, I think that's a really good question, Ellie, but I would take it a little further and say that how is that, the question that you asked, how is it different from a question you would ask any architect making any form, drawing anything in plan, right? Or section. Um, and so I feel that, I feel that this this team has taken has taken uh, taken the that that um, has taken the project further, and we do see moments where they've inhabited them through collage. There are scale figures. They've they've put these elements and these pieces together, and then they've they've started looking at what that space gives you. Now, the difference mm -hmm. between um, their work, the way they've operated, and how an architect might work is that. The architect can then take that circular element or that piece of, you know, corridor and whatnot and change it, modify it to respond to what he or she uh, has as an intention for that space in terms of its experience. But here they are confined to the objet trouvé, the, you know, found objects uh, and the spaces in between them, but those objects are, are sort of fixed. So that's the rule of the game that they have to play with. And so when they look at the perspectival uh, aspect of it or the experiential sequence that, that they're investigating, if they don't like it, all they can do is maybe move that one piece to another part of the of the, the assembly and see if that works better. Um, but uh, so, so I don't know how much you've investigated back and forth in terms of the actual uh, instances of one piece to the other. But I do want to say that I think that all the images that we're looking at here, the representation um, and, and the messaging behind the representation is so cohesive. They are absolutely beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. You've obviously, you know, I don't know if you've looked at Archigram, but that comes to mind a lot. Um, <laughs> you have, um, but um, in, some of, in some of the pieces, it's, it's kind of evident. Uh, and I, and I, I love the spirit of it. I love the spirit of play and, um, and assembly and sort of like lack of preciousness of every piece. It's kind of, what I don't really quite get um, is the ceremony aspect of it. Like, I understand mm -hmm. the game, but to me it's, it, and I understand the rules of the game assembly and playing it, but, but to me, I don't see the, ceremonial aspect. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, the, the fall being the research heavy portion of um, this project, we had a large chunk of that um, exploring um, what makes unique, or what, sorry, what makes play unique to humans, why that sets us apart from, let's say animals or, um, and I guess the relationship between play, performance, and ritual, how those three have evolved from each other. Um, we're looking at, okay, well, you have things that are playful or like games, you know, you can break those rules. Um, but then when looking at a ritual, something that's so structured, I guess, um, like what does it mean to be breaking those types of rules? Um, and it was, I guess mostly to start asking ourselves um, those types of questions, like um, like what rules are we breaking, um, whether it's um, while we're designing in the process or just um, like programmatically or in like a conventional building. Um, uh, in the end of the, I guess like the end result of the project, it wasn't really about um, having some ritualistic like process involved in, in the project is, a part of our research that uh, we we got a lot of uh, other uh, overarching ideas from. So, I mean, couldn't you couldn't you see um, ceremony as the opposite of play? Because when you go into play, there is no set outcome mm -hmm. out of it. That's the point of playing. Mm -hmm. I think so. 
-hmm. But with ceremony, there is always, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end. There is always, you know, what's going to happen and mm -hmm. when it's going to happen. And that's the point of ceremony. And they kind of like go, yes. at least for me, they kind of go in opposite directions. They both have a purpose, but they go in opposite directions. It, it's 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 disciplined versus undisciplined. So I totally agree with you. It's like mm -hmm. um, ceremony is a discipline. Um, what you're talking about here is an undisciplined play. I mean, it could be that there are two kinds of spaces or two. There's a dialogue or relationship between the two of them that uh, comes out through how you've generated and arranged these forms. I mean, this the sort of thing that comes to mind for me about this is that when you first start showing a lot of the actual graphics of the material. Um, Cedric Price kept coming up in my head and the sort of thing that I was asking mm -hmm. myself about this is you know what about this is open what about this allows for undisciplined play um, because what you've created I feel is still quite static it's something that has been built and is kind of unchanging to some degree you have a lot of different kinds of spaces that can allow a lot of freedom and you haven't told them this is exactly what the program of this space is going to be and that's great but I think there, for me, there, there's two missed opportunities to add even more dynamism to this. One is um, uh, the opportunity for you to say, yes, you can actually change these spaces. There's a, a certain dynamic where it can change over time based upon a change in program. So it's not so solidified. So these plans where you've got your floor plans listed, they can be broken apart. They can be changed. It can be uh, movable either day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year. If you don't want to go that far towards like a full machine aesthetic where the thing is is a, is a living machine that can be moved around, you could go the route of something that is um, you start almost with the genesis, the first spark of what this building is going to be, but with the intention that it changes every two or three years, a new appendage comes on, a new piece comes on, different designers, different architects, different people, and it ends up becoming an assemblage that takes place over time and can change over time. I mean, the one the one of the examples that was given before, and I think it was, maybe it was you, Ellie, that said this just uh, at the beginning of this was, you know, what about this makes me want to come in and play? And and the, the thing that came to mind for me was a few years ago, taking my daughter to City Museum in St. Louis, which takes over an old <laughs> warehouse, has a whole bunch of different installations in it. Some of them poking through floors. You can actually change them, but a lot of them are just these amorphous shapes in some cases some of them suggest crawl through me or jump on me or run up me but it doesn't tell you exactly what you need to do and that's the sort of stuff that comes into mind for me I do think there's some opportunity for a lot of that stuff in what you have here um, but I do feel that it's still um, it's visually impressive and visually dynamic and interesting but I'm wondering if experientially if over time it doesn't hold on to that dynamism but Shane, what, what you're saying and actually what Hannah's saying are, are making me kind of reconsider the beginning question. And I'm wondering if really the question here is about rules-based play versus serendipity, meaning an open field yeah. allows for infinite play because you actually don't do infinite play. There's rules of the game if it's soccer or basketball or whatever that kind of prescribe you within the rectangle. Um, you know. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Ellie, what, what you're saying on that, because I feel like this is definitely more a board game prescribed discussion less about ceremonious yeah tea ceremony discussion um and it's definitely like rule-based um super like stan allen ish um again okay I'm, I'm just celebrating the fact again I'm, I'm gonna step back after saying this but um i think this reminds me of like 2004 2007 type of stephen gage bob shiel bartlett type of projects yeah mixed with um and one one project you guys really should check out is this bakery that won the reba president's medal uh that was led by stephen gage at the bartlett um and then another kind of reminiscence of the drawing style representationally as hannah was like com uh, commending was um it just a lot of the the graphics i mean obviously beyond um uh, bernard schumi and Parc de la Villette, um, that type of play, I think is gonna be more successful in terms of description of pavilion style and like transitional as what Shane was talking about in terms of serendipitous um, moments and temporal inter engagements in a park setting. But also you might wanna celebrate that this is actually a play about you two more and how you define the form based of how you actually designed the the formal aspects of it because this is a very 
tactile project. Another book that you might want to check and you might have already seen is the Cities Without Ground book by Jonathan Solomon. Called Amazing Ground book. And, uh, Amazing. I mean, the graphics here are so right. similar. So exactly. And I think what you've, you're missing in your representational drawings here are the moments below ground, actually, not above ground. Mm. It's the moments that are beyond the kind of interstitial spaces that are missing here. Um, the details, the, the like the human moments. I, I, I love the way that you're representing it. I love the models that you're doing it, but I think the detailed moments could really help you. And I, I really want to say that your sections and your zoom in moments don't does not do it the graphical justice of the zoom out versions, but that's just me. I feel like it, it, mm -hmm. it, it loses the contextual elements once you get way too deep, at least the way that you're representing the renders. And I think that's what Hannah also mentioned earlier. And, and that's basic, that's where I'm heading there. But yeah, you know, great job. Um, very Bartlett, <laughs> very like yeah, representational, but definitely check out, um, I, I would celebrate a little bit more of the, sh the Shumi aspect of the theoretical um, discussion of, of the park and, and engagement and fun and play. Uh, Molly Hunker is actually another good one I think you, you wanna look into. Um, uh, they're they're out in, in U University of Michigan. I think they're more like contemporary architects, obviously. But um, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. I think the, I mean, the I, Shumi- I wanna go back to, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, no, just really quickly. I just wanted to, to kind of build on the, the kind of this hybrid of the reference of Shumi, some of Jonathan Solomon's work and even Cedric Price, which is to say that like, I, I completely agree. Um, and I think one thing maybe that's missing, and I, I also agree with the comment that it'd be nice to be able to be in a space where we could actually look at the drawings because I could be completely wrong and just misremembering your presentation, which was now a little while back. But one of the things I think maybe is missing a bit is the idea of the city as the player or a player in this kind mm -hmm. of arrangement. And I think that like the representations that you're showing uh, sort of necessarily always erase the city a little bit like it always has the white fill underneath or the colored fill underneath and the way in which your design participates with the city seems um, maybe a little bit more of an act of erasure than one in which the things can kind of combine into a new symbiosis or like a new synthesis and I think Cedric Price is a great reference not for the fun palace which maybe is the the easiest Cedric Price reference in terms of like play but in terms of the Magnets project and the Lung for Manhattan projects, um, or even Pottery Think Belt to a certain degree, but projects in which uh, the kind of landscape and the context were as important as the architectural intervention. Um, and those things actually oriented themselves around one another um, in a way where actually the game was much more open and it was a much more urban gesture rather than being a kind of like building as fill gesture, which is I think maybe where I find the project um, whole holds the city a little bit too far back or too much at arm's distance. Um, and so I think that like the, yeah, I mean, beautifully designed, beautifully represented, um, but I wouldn't lose sight of the fact that like the, the context can actually be part of this game in a way that like either as this kind of serendipitous game or one in which is like very rule-based and, and kind of regulated. Um, but I would, I would sort of fold that back in a little bit more beyond just like the act of birding, for example, which I think, um, sort of represents itself opportunistically, but not ontologically within the kind of framework of the project. I like yeah, that. I, I mean, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, like I think, I also think about Cedric Price, like it's been brought up a lot and, and more specifically like the, the generator project. Um, I think that's really kind of applicable. Not so much Shumi for me, um, just because I think this, 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 this has something a little bit more at stake than, um, than Park Villette. It's like leaves you a little bit lost when you um, visit it. Um, but yeah, this, 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 it's, it's a beautifully represented project. And I'm, I was so excited to see these like amazing models you had in the beginning. Um, you know, and you, you go back to, to Cedric too. And there was always, there was always like something, um, that worked with um, these elements, like for instance, a crane, um, you know, and I wonder like, what, it, what is the facilitator for this? You know, people have been speaking about uh, movement or growth um, or that it would change over time. Um, but yeah, this, this point about um, agency and bringing back agency to the play, I think is really important, right? Um, that someone has the ability to, to give um, and to get something back in a way. 
And I, I think speculatively about, you know, not just play for leisure, but play for um, education or um, play for something greater. Um, there's a really interesting game project that came out online. Um, it was called uh, Peptide. And uh, anyone could build these really elaborate DNA strands and they made it fun, like a game. And it, you could play it from like a five-year-old to, a, to an, uh, you know, someone uh, older. Um, but that you participated with something larger than yourself, um, which I think is, is, is really, really interesting um, as, as like an, another level of, you know, potentially giving back to not just the city, um, but uh, on a global scale, um, that play is something fun, but it also generates something. I think that's kind of um, really important. Um, but my gosh, beautiful work, both of you. I'm just like so excited with everything. Like the, the aesthetic that you started with in the beginning is just like phenomenal. I think you should take that um, and continue to, to play this out. Um, like animations, I think would be really, really interesting. Um, or eventually, I know you guys <laughs> from seminars, you know, like build build this in like a Unity platform. <laughs> that would be <laughs> awesome and put it online. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, beautiful work um, yeah. yeah it's it's gorgeous yeah I think just I mean working on it I think your project is I I'm always have kind of sympathy for the project of taking on play I think there's so much good uh, ground and I think you guys have kind of gotten into a, into a lot of it um, so kudos on, on a great project I do think that kind of final representation that uh, when you're developing something like this that's opening up a kind of new notions of play. And then you talk about the birds and how you're kind of embedding this into environment and you kind of, that's an architecture for, of the birds and having like some type of representation where you can imagine people playing inside of it. But the representations have to, I think, do more work at the end to actually begin to describe the kind of deviant human bird playful types of things that would actually emerge out of it. And I think because you've introduced the already, the beginning of the history of it, of that it was this kind of this forgotten site that we actually want to look at a big future here. Because you've opened up the whole history in the beginning, we actually want to see your project lead to a kind of a big future and give us a series of representations of what we're going to get in year one, year 10, year 50, and how this kind of new notions of play will actually be opened up through the architecture. And so I think the project has to kind of find a way to speculate through this kind of machinic thing and give us new possibilities. Uh, and I think that's an important part of the project. And I'm not sure game engine that I think you can actually begin to turn to new media. Uh, you talk about, and I think people have opened up the question that sort of within the world of play, game is one branch of yeah. play. And so games, and I like the way you've talked about it, that you do typically have a series of rules within gameplay that allow people to come to a common discourse, to flex and to work those rules and develop style and engage one another within a set of rules, that's gameplay. And so for you to take apart a series of objects, these kind of bricolage like thin objects, you take apart the passport, or you take apart the machines, you take apart things. You do want to see a series of more, kind of a little bit more stringent rules about how you're actually taking things apart. And then to, to the points raised, I think the city is, is obviously a key character here. That we see people like Kevin Lynch, you know, there's ways that he's dissected the city into five different parts of monuments and edges and nodes and da da da, the Kevin Lynch. Like, are you actually also finding this sweet spot between the kind of the ecological, the architectural scale and the urban scale to create this kind of field of objects that allows a kind of inter-ecological, inter-urban architectural like play, but you're actually exploding in this question of the Shumi of finding a way to kind of uh, condense aspects of the city to kind of make the city more playable when you leave the architecture. And so I think there are people, you know, like, and I, thinking of Kevin Lynch as the kind of most direct person of like taking very different principles in cities and allowing them to come back to play. And people like Van Eyck are also kind of key, you know, he literally dissected the city and brought those elements of the city to a playground. So you're literally like playing the city while you're playing the playground. And that's the kind of history of like post-World War II like playground. And so I think your project is, is fantastic in that way, but I do kind of, I actually want a little bit more of the rules. Um, because I think you can be more deviant then. And then two, I think the, the discourse, there's an amazing discourse of play. There's Hazinga, Magic Circle, Kelwa. There's a series of really awesome people that have theorized a lot about play and the different principles of play that I think could actually help you 
uh, write through and be a little bit more kind of manifesto-ish about like what, again, back to agency, like what is the agency embedded in the project? Because I think there's that kind of haunt, there's a kind of ghostly thing that's in there that you can be more explicit about. Yeah, I think just to um, pick up on the more rules to be deviant is sort of interesting. And I'm looking because you're sharing your screen and it's it's the Mario slide is up. Um, I was thinking about, um, I don't know if you guys looked at Corey Archangel's work at all during this process, but um, Corey Archangel is this like really cool artist who in the late 90s and early 2000s hacked a Super Mario cartridge and basically yes. made an unending Oh, we field. did. It's the, the blank. The yeah, it's just like the clouds yeah. that go by mm -hmm. like forever. Um, and I, I'm sort of thinking that maybe an architectural analogy in the context of an airport is more like Berlin's Tempelhof would be the, the analogous thing to the um, Mario Clouds by Cory Archangel, which is to like take the site and produce kind of strategic forms of indeterminacy within a context of, uh, that's otherwise like totally deterministic. Um, and I, I think it's really about orchestrating and maybe that's what kind of ties some of these comments about play together. It's really about orchestrating where there are rules and where there's openness and being able to play within that as a kind of architectural intervention. Um, and I would say again, sorry, to be irresponsible with the reading of your project, but just I'm, I'm running off memory now completely from, from your earlier presentation, but it feels to me like there's a kind of uniform degree of intensity all the way across that kind of makes the entire thing ironically homogenous, um, just in its kind of relentlessness of these shapes and these forms and these interactions and the scale of things. And, you know, on the one hand, it's like so stunning and beautiful. And on the other, maybe to, to the kind of point of the studio about composition, you sort of need the relief of the choreography angel clouds occasionally uh, in order to kind of like produce something that feels a little bit more oriented and not so self-similar. Yeah, I mean, maybe like just a footnote of this kind of the world of play. There is someone like Gibson, who's actually a really interesting character who works in like landscape and play play design where he literally like categorizes, categorizes like objects and their playability. And that if you have like multiple types of play, like each object, you can design it to actually maximize this playability, both in like narrative play, game play, competition. Like he looks at every object and realizes that if you actually do very small things, you actually start multiplying like a force multiplier, like its possibility in terms of playability. And so he literally, I mean, he goes, he wants to, he builds metrics for objects about their playability, that he's looking and assessing objects and realizing like small tweaks allow for it to be kind of a narrative object or like to be used in gameplay. And he's like literally assessing and building this kind of like wide metrics and typ typological understanding of, of maximizing the impact of play, which is super interesting. I guess we don't think of it given over to social sciences, but people like that have done that. So you can actually begin again, not that you would ever, ever tell anyone, but actually that you can feel that there would actually be some like kind of hidden force that you can actually begin to make judgments that oscillate between the kind of like compositional dexterity that you guys have, but actually a series of rules that actually can push this kind of secret agenda to kind of like also, uh, so you can think through like how to get from where you are to actually playability for humans or animals. Yeah. One of the, one of the, where I'll start is one of the, hearing people talk about just starting from the word play. And I am learning more about him. He's a super interesting figure, which is Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein and his talk about how meeting, how we drive meaning from words and what is a game. And I, I think this is one of the kind of challenges of architecture when you start to try to derive a project from a word and what that means and how you interpret it and how you build upon that. Um, it's an ambitious thing and we continue to always do that because how it's not only do we communicate through drawings and buildings, we also communicate it through language as we try to describe what we're doing. Um, as I'm a little bit, sometimes I'm a little bit surprised about how, like one of some of the images that were finalized on, they seem sometimes a little predictable for when, when people throw out the word play, I, there's color check. The, the, the stuff seems to kind of be disorganized check. So I, 
I appreciate the kind of starting from all the words we like to use in architecture, representation, abstract, all, all the all these things that we just kind of put into our lexicon. Um, and I just, I caution sometimes becoming so comfortable with those words and I was thinking that we can just kind of use them and morph into all these different things. I, um, yeah, I guess I'm, 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 I'm just a little surprised on sometimes the kind of predictableness. And actually I feel like the project is so final, like everything is figured out and I like the machines are all figured out. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm a little bit on the other end. I, I think of the word play and I, I, I don't know. I guess through this conversations with hearing everybody else talk, I've kind of, I guess this is kind of how it works when we have discussions in theory and going back and forth. I've kind of felt like I've went to the other side now hearing everybody talk about stuff. And I, one of the, beauties of just a generic container is that you go inside of it and you can do anything you want with it and then there's no limitations and so i guess that's why it's a great project i guess that's why it's a great project because it makes us challenge what what we think where we think we're at and the how we approach things so um, yeah i guess i'm it's making me think. And, but at the same time, some of it feels a little predictable. And the fact that we can sometimes quote so many known references, archigram, all of these ones, you know, like, I challenge the you to push it further to break out some of the the visuals that are very stunning don't get me wrong but i th i think that after you graduate you'll feel the challenge of what you're asking of yourself and what you'll generate by asking the big questions Before we, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, before we land with a thud, um, we uh, uh, we still have a little bit of time left, and a chance to just offer some some um, wrap up comments and maybe squeeze a little bit more out of the conversation before we, we uh, change uh, presenters. I, uh, I mean, first I'm, thing, I'm glad we have a little bit more time because I, I actually wanted to pick up on the. Uh... Oh, sorry. All right, go ahead. No, I was going to pick up on the challenge laid down by by Sam, because I think that over time, the conversation sort of tended to focus on the early studies rather than the later project. That's also because that's what's up on the screen. I think if you guys scroll down to some of the later plans and the, and, and the renderings, I think it's what's good about this project is it's actually fairly easy to be specific about what is the difference between kind of spatial play versus like the play of the process. Um, and what I mean by that is is that within a lot of these plans, um, the way that you imagine that you might move across of them. So if you start to take a look at like some of the ones where you see like page 30, for example, I've always really been struck by the pairing of the kind of, um, I don't know, like wrench shaped corridor. Yeah. So I think I think what these guys are, are, are in a way suggesting is that there are ways that you move across this, this plan and experience moments and transition from space to space to space, you know, coming through here, for example, crossing over another space, dipping underneath. And, and I'm, I'm reading these plans in a very specific way for what the interiority of these things would allow. And I think the interiors, um, or let's say the planning, the way you'd move through this uh, would actually create a lot more of that serendipity than the exterior renderings seem to suggest because the exterior renderings turn these things back into the objects that you lost when you collage them. So I, th I think that the more opportunities you have to create sort of moments of surprise 
that happen as you transition from one set of spaces to another. By the way, you're hearing my three and a half year old playing in the background. Um, is it's it's actually a richer. So to Sam's point, when when you actually create unexpected collisions or unexpected moments as you move across this thing, it's a lot of a richer field to mine. When you get to the later renderings and you see each of these things as more discrete objects, I think that goes kind of counter um, to the original original proposition that you guys were setting out, which is to allow these sorts of accidental and serendipitous um, moments to evolve as one interacts with this whole kind of complex. I'll take the, you know, I'll add something. I mean, for me, it's actually, it's either the project needs more of a narrative component where you're literally t describing the project through a kind of narrative lens, or you actually have to go through more of a principle lens. And the second one, we are like the Shumi, there's like ways that Shumi is creating trans programming, like putting two programs together. And there's a series of theories, like a series of set principled relationships that he's setting up and breaking. And they're very like, you understand that the play is happening in very discrete moments. If play happens everywhere, it typically dissolves everywhere also. And so what are the types of playful elements that you're describing, right? What are the, how are you setting the things up? What are the principles of threshold of linear access? Like setting up either a set of principles and that goes the theory side, like the principled relationships or actually really pushing the kind of narrative component of the project would actually help kind of like anchor like a what you mean about play but I think also allow it to be a lot more tangible and then dot 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 by extension allow more discourse around your project at the end projects are really are very like from the self if you don't actually allow enough room for people to latch onto discourse, you actually have to have, have common ground, common terms, common language, common ideas for all of us to get on board and to play for us to understand them. And right now I feel like the project is like so beautiful and we can all enter in different vantage points, but it's hard to kind of have a common discourse around your project, but it doesn't either have the common rules, dot, 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 theory and principles, or it actually doesn't have a common narrative for us to kind of wrestle around. And so for either of those two positions would actually be for me a better, a best way to kind of retell the story of about principles and da, 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 or actually through the, a narrative lens. Uh, one thing I want to highlight about this last set of comments, I do think that um, Antonio did a wonderful job of clearly articulating one of the big challenges of doing say a healthy a socially healthy building in the sense that, you know, the notion that there is a margin for somebody to cling to, it seems to me in most cases to be the only option only because the kind of sympathy you described among Antonio is so rare, uh, at least it has been in, in, in my limited experience. And that could just be a reflection of my my professional acumen to be perfectly frank. But uh, the, um, the, the notion that um, you know, the building needs to kind of maintain a certain distance um, from prescription in order to, to be rich in that respect, I think is important. It's certainly something that uh, um, uh, uh, takes a lot of humility to execute as well. And this is not a project that I would say uh, is, is, has attempts to uh, assume a kind of hum uh, a position of humility with respect to the site or with respect to the kind of articulation of the project. And I, I think, um, you know, a, a moment ago we heard um, some, re some really poignant comments um, uh, from Ellie and Samuel about, uh, you know, the, the kind of meaning uh, of this level of articulation of project and its impact on its future as a kind of truly deployable idea. And from my point of view, this represents the core challenge that was in front of uh, uh, critics, because um, I can't speak entirely for Professor Bowden, but I, I think it would largely see eye to eye that, that um, we were both eager to see a different future for this project, one different than the future of the work by authors and architects like Cedric Price, one where he simply said, well, what, what, what is a building that kind of assumes this level of, of whimsicality? Does it really have a, a, a place in the physical world that demonstrates how it's going to manage all these really important questions? Uh, and uh, insisted that they produce the documentation that um, drives it in that direction. Um, we've. I think everybody would probably agree that there, there are three categories in which the documentation would fall into. And it's that latter one 
um, perhaps the firsthand experiences documented on the, on the renderings where you know, these really important questions get raised. I don't think anybody would really question the influence of, of uh, the ideas of groups like Archogram and Cedric Price. But I also, I find it hard to believe there'd be a lot of people out there would, would um, say that you know, the, I, the real kind of physical ideas present in those projects are actually present in the built environment at large. That kind of whimsicality is very rare. Uh, and, you know, for a building to um, assume a position like this project has, I think the real breakthrough would be to find a way to execute it so that we do have that kind of lying around out there somewhere uh, to engage uh, in a way that is as, as positive as the kind of... Uh, um, uh, attitudes and ambitions in this group here. So. Yeah, I, I I wanted to add that uh, in picking up on um, Antonio's view about um, uh, the common narrative or the common principles. It, an ambition for this for this team, which brought uh, joy and play and a challenge to every every single studio, whether in studio or online studio, um, would be to go back to say the collages um, that you did on uh, I believe it's slide uh, uh, fifteen and sixteen, especially sixteen, and go back and, and interrogate those very seriously, very closely, even from a like super articulate orthographic sense to see what you find and then from there be able to pick up on this idea of a um some, a, a common narrative or a common set of principles to then take those investigations those interrogations to another level i mean it's something we would tell all ourselves to do. if we any one of us in this picture view here uh came up with a series of drawings collages like this that's the, the least we would ask of, our, of ourselves because we realize we uncovered something so profoundly interesting, exciting, and a step forward for architecture. Um, even though it, it, some some folks see a, a look back, not all, but you know, there is a, a, actually a future, a very incredible future embedded in these. So it really isn't come about you as young architects joining us to go back and interrogate those and show us, show us where we're going. I, I just find them profoundly optimistic and relevatory. Congratulations, Susie, Tyler. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work. And uh, yes. a quick shout out to Saul again. I just wanted to make sure that you know, he gets his, his, his he's amazing. Uh, he was here a moment. He is. He's in here somewhere in, in my Brady Bunch grid. Um, that, uh, you know, his uh, background in, in our criticism, our history was extremely valuable and, and you know, ferreting out the um, uh, uh, the uh, all of the, the potential and the work that we that was on the table throughout the term. Um, I said it earlier uh, today, and, and just wanted to make sure you said it again. So it was a pleasure working with you this term. Thanks for all your hard work. Yep. So. Thank you, guys. Um, it's been really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that it has. Uh, all right. Um, Saul, mine. We should give each other assignments this summer. John and I will write text, Saul, and you design a building, and then we'll see what happens. See how we affected each other. Uh, you don't want me drawing anything. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you guys for sticking, sticking around. Um, I think this is the final stretch or final project. Um, I'll just quickly introduce um, our section and um, I guess Hazel and, Hazel and Ying's project. Um, I'm Michael Savas. I teach this section with, with Abby Cougar Hume and our HMS faculty is um, Ashley Simone. Um, and I, you know, our, our section, the topic, um, the general topic is free time, um, and we use we use the definition of free time as uh, the non-productive use of time, uh, which is a Thorsten Veblen definition from uh, his his uh, I guess book, uh, the Theory of the Leisure Class, which was published in in 1899. Um, you know, right around the time uh, when there was um, 
a lot of, uh, I guess, industrial revolution, a lot of automation. There was a promise of, you know, a 30 hour work week, um, which, you know, I think some of that stuff still continues today that, you know, innovation or technology will enable a more, let's say, leisurely life. Um, and so we, you know, in the, in the fall, we, we have the students look at more speculative work. We start off by having them look at um, the, the Super Studios 12 Cautionary Tales. Um, you know, with the idea that architecture can be more than just the design of a building, but can be, you know, a way to, to frame a discussion, not only about, you know, let's say right answers, but also about necessarily what could go wrong. Um, and I think, you know, Hazel and Ying for their project have taken on um, the, the idea of, of work and leisure in the, in the corporate workspace. And, you know, in, in their case, um, you know, they've taken on these things in a, in a very discreet way. Um, and, and of course, they'll, they'll explain the project, um, you know, through drawings, et cetera, and in a much more precise way. But I think for, for, for us, for me at least, I think, you know, it's, it's been exciting, you know, watching them develop the project. There are a couple of things that happened throughout the semester um, that I think were interesting. I, I think, you know, Hazel and Yang are both talented uh, students. You know, they have huge technical capacity. They produce you know, really beautiful drawings. But I think, you know, one of the crutches of that is, you know, this idea that that representation, you know, might just be a, um, you know, something that comes after your idea that, you know, it is something that you explain a project through rather than develop it through. And so I think there are a couple of things in the semester where um, I think they shifted, you know, from, you know, critical geniuses to embracing the kind of idea that a project is indeterminate, that um, the project is something that the idea develops through the project rather than you you wait, you know, you have an idea and then you simply draw that. And one of those cases was, um, you know, right before spring break, I think we had, we, we were fairly excited by their project or at least the, the initial um, development of it. And we, we thought, well, you, you guys should build a big model. Um, that's the only way you're going to see these spaces. And and Hazel and Ying said, you know, just said, well, we don't, we don't want to do a big model for the end of this project. You know, so it wasn't even about a, a model to uh, to develop the project. It was more thinking about, well, if we did something, we'd do it at the end once everything's figured out. We don't want to build a big model because um, we want to make a big drawing. So they kind of already knew, you know, how the project was going to play out, um, or at least thought they did, I guess. And so I think for me, you know, at that moment, they decided to make the big model, and it was a big discovery. And, you know, they'll, they'll probably, you know, use um, different language and make it sound, you know, much more um, intentional. But I think basically built, you know, a model of their of their site and used it as a kind of trash can um, to throw stuff in. Um, and I think, you know, there was this this kind of level of, um, you know, idiosyncratic development. There were a lot of interesting things that were discovered. And I think, you know, they there was a big shift in their project. I think at that moment. Um, and then unfortunately, that was right before spring break. So after kind of you know, coaxing them to do this model. Um, everyone was working from home and they can no longer build models. Um, but I think it, even though they, they couldn't really build models anymore, I think it changed kind of the direction of the project and their attitude towards the project. Um, the other thing that I think, you know, was interesting about the development of their project was actually, or, or I guess not a development, I guess we'll see today. I mean, I guess I, I'm more, this is less a description, but more, you know, potentially provoking them, which is, um, our final, which I guess was like a week or so ago uh, for the studio, was that I realized, you know, and this with a lot of our students, is, is the idea of being a good architecture student and how that might also undermine, you know, the, the, the fact that a project can be indeterminate. Um, Hazel and Ying are very good architecture students. Um, I think, you know, the question is, and it's not to say that being a good architecture student is bad, um, I do think it's a step that you need to kind of go through, um, and I think degree project is is a is is the best place um, to transcend like what it means to be a good architecture student. That you know, a good architecture student might use um, you know the the kind of most often asked question towards the end of a project is, do I have to figure out my do I do the bathrooms have to work? You know, that if the bathrooms work, it's kind of an alibi for um, you know producing, let's say, exuberant form, et cetera. Um, but, you know, that, that, that a project can frame much bigger issues. Um, you know, a good architecture student always has 
the right answer is a good architecture student um, tells you why their project works. A good architecture student might, you know, make a space for work and a space for leisure and assume that everyone will follow those rules that someone may not actually go and work in the place that's designated for leisure um, or imagine their project in that context. Um, I think, you know, Hazel and Ying, you know, did a lot of research um, and, and they're going to they're going to flash this slide up, I think. I think it's still in the presentation, but it's a slide where they kind of, you know, conflate well-being um, with capitalism and altruism with corporate greed as if they could be the same thing, um, which is frankly, you know, about as absurd as it is, I, at least personally, I think interesting. All the companies are referencing, whether it's Google or Facebook, um, you know, talk about the well-being of their employees in this kind of veil. Um, so I guess, I guess, you know, my, my introduction is less about their project, but more provocation for them is to not just be, um, you know, I know as good architecture students, they already have their presentation plan. Um, but, you know, my hope is that at least in the questions, they don't, you know, they, they, they move past good architecture students and, um, you know, they really talk to you, you guys about those issues and you guys bring up those issues because I think their project and the playfulness of their project and their drawings um, gives them a lot of latitude, which I think is better served, you know, taking on some of these bigger issues, which, you know, I think they'll talk about in the beginning. Uh, but, but again, I wouldn't let them fool you. I mean, I think those are the, those are the issues you, you all should, uh, should bring up with them. Okay, uh, so you guys are ready, uh, Hazel, Hazel and Yang? Yeah. Okay, so hi, hi everyone. We're Hazel and Yang, the founders of Perkspace. So um, Perkspace addresses the idea that office architecture needs distinctive boundaries between work and leisure in order to foster a healthy relationship between corporation and its employee. We have seen corporations like Google have designed those really fancy but kind of superficial blend of work and leisure in their open plan offices. Um, those are really cool, but we decided to be boring and go back to the basic, which is to design cubicles for the office workers. So we started this company called Perkspace last year that makes alternative cubicles in service of conflating the boundary between work and leisure. And these are best-selling cubicles that offer a wide range of options that we created from last year's research seminar. Every cubicle is different. For example, our cube 1.2 features a jacuzzi inside the cubicle. It is pretty popular among the office workers. We also have active cubicles, for example, the, a trampoline inside the cubicle. And this is a lounge cubicle accommodates long hour workers position. We have also put some tropical palm trees inside cubicle. We then look at Alan Wexler's work, how to build a digital brick wall, which uses a mouse made of brick to build a brick wall on the computer. And it provides another way of thinking through extreme littleness and the use of material. From that, we want to create our own version, which is how to assemble a non-working desk. So this desk has tumbling surface made of ceramic pieces, which we aim to destabilize uh, workers' routine in the cubicle and give them a hard time to work. After designing those cubicles, we, design, we decided to build a headquarter for our company. Perkspace's new headquarter is located inside Ford Foundation. Our site, the Ford Foundation, inspired us to advance the vision for humane architecture, which Kevin Roach established in the original design. We want to express the same mentality of our cubicle design in the new headquarter, which is, which is the use of discrete and individualized volumes. Last semester, we researched on the concept of absurdity, which we defined by the coexistence of contradiction in the modern corporate culture. The contradictions we want to explore in perk space include altruistic public space and profit-driven space to observe customers, customization and standardization, genuine concern for employees' well-being and corporate greed. 
By creating explicit boundary, which allows unlikely juxtaposition, we want to manifest the, the absurdity of modern corporate culture and create a new office typology that benefits corporations, employees, and the public simultaneously. We also aim to rethink the process of design and production, contrasting to the diverging design and production process of traditional design companies such as IKEA. Perkspace creates an ecosystem of design and production programs, where design studio, prototyping room, showroom, and distribution center are located in the same building and interacting interacting with each other, resulting in better design of our products. Contradiction between the inside and outside manifests itself in an unattached lining, which produces an additional space between the lining and the exterior wall. So we look at Venturi's idea about inside and outside in complexity and the contradiction as a lens to define contradiction architecturally. We look at modern architecture cases such as uh, Maurice Store and Willis Wall which both shows a contradiction between the inside volume and outside bounding box or boundary. The project thus departs as an infield project inside the bounding box of Ford Foundation. In order to disrupt visual continuity between the atrium and the floor space, we explored six options of filling the atrium. And after observing the results, we decided to utilize the strategies that create the richest layer of in-between spaces. So in contrast to the traditional stacking program boxes organizational strategy, we decided to toss all the programs into the middle and preserve the original floor space. We want to contrast large companies such as Google's strategy of inserting leisure space inside workplace to conflate the boundary of work and leisure. And we believe architecture with distinct boundaries between work and leisure provides employees a sense of clarity and control of their time and action during a workday. So our tossing strategy started with volume selection, considering ideas about volume quality and its potential program. For example, a sphere can be a destabilizer of the composition, and a disc is more like an open plane, which can be an amphitheater for lectures about cubicle history. And this is the process of re-tossing uh, stuff into the site model, and things started to get really excited as we test the infield strategy with physical model. With this model, we start to see how gravity creates random chaos, but also compelling spaces. We also took close shots inside the model and we start to realize the, re the relationship between solid and white, voluminous and scale. So from this model, we started to think about the concept of interior urbanism. And we want to create a three-dimensional figure ground that accommodates various programs and uh, think about the question, what does it mean to exist inside, outside, and in between volumes? So by looking at conditions at the physical model, we further investigated how programs can be assigned to each volumes based on their potential spatial conditions. For example, a horizontal cylinder can become a circulation tunnel and the cone can become a showroom. And here is the final catalog of how our volumes were assigned with program. So after the atrium is infilled with geometric volumes, we assigned different materials to each volume in order to increase people's awareness of their experience in the in-between space. For example, one can walk in between a wall made of marble and a wall made of bricks. And that will evokes, it evokes the awareness of being in contradictions. We preserve the original floor space so that they can still function as offices. The infilled volumes intersect with the original floor slabs at several spots, creating openings which allow the employees to enter the volumes. There's also a public circulation path that goes around the exterior of the volumes, but at certain times penetrates through the volume and allow the public to access the interior space. Finally, the facades acts as a dominant force that unifies the incongruous programs, the incongruous volumes into a difficult hole by cutting through those leaning against it and exposing the inside to the pedestrian level. And another way to uh, manifest the contradictions through nesting volumes 
in this case, two differently oriented volumes uh, are nested. And by cutting an opening on the outside volume, the, in, the inside volume is reviewed. And we desire, um, and through that we desire to disrupt visual continuities between boundaries through its structure and material. So at the ground floor of our building, there are three entrances. One is the original entrance for the general public. One is the original entrance for the office workers. And one is an opening we created for a public tour. At the fifth floor, the public circulation goes from a lecture space passing through employees pool and goes into a showroom that overlooks the cubicle warehouse. At ninth floor, the public tour ends on the disc-like amphitheater. This is the point where employees and the public physically meet. They can watch the public, they can watch screenings of movies about cubicles in the same space. From this series of plans, you can see how the paths of employees and the path of the public start to separate, become parallel, uh, uh, become parallel at several points, at several points, allowing the designers to observe the public's reaction to the products and allowing the public to observe the company's leisure and production spaces. And this diagram shows how the public and employees occupy the same volumes in different layers of the in-between spaces and how their experiences are juxtaposed. And for this perspective shows you uh, the view inside the lobby where the public can still use the existing garden in the atrium while the volumes are just stacking on top of their head. And here is the intersection of the leisure volumes with a corporate workspace, uh, which creates a portal where employees can distinctively decide to leave work and enter leisure. And here is the point where the public and the employees physically meet at this um, quirk made amphitheater where movies about cubicles are screened and it becomes a public program with shared users. And this interior perspective shows two volumes that are intersected. The one on the left is a cubicle warehouse where a showroom is nested inside. The one on the right is the employee's pool space where a public lecture space is next nested inside. And the public circulation goes through the volumes, allowing the public to go in and interact with the designers in different ways. This is the axle section cut right behind two facades. And we want to zoom in and see some of the spaces and programs. So here is the prototype room that helps designer and customer make their own customized cubicle. And it has pitfalls for designer to look into the process of making of the cubicles. And next to the prototyping room is a tube tunnel for material transportation. And here you can see public circulation path go around and into two showrooms. The one on the left is a soft showroom that has new cubicles on the pedestal. And inside the showroom, the designer occupy another layer of space, which can secretly observe the showroom through the peepholes. And um, here you can see there are two types of circulation. One is more of a conventional way using our escalator, which penetrates the volumes and spaces. And the other way is to climb and hike on the outside surface of the volumes, which is more like an active path. And we also have a, a war room for designer to discuss their design issues, but it's more like a pillow war room. And going down to the atrium garden, we have a public lecture room for the history of cubicles. And employees are also allowed to visit in a separate space inside the lecture hall. And here's a video about uh, two visitors came into our company and gave us some reviews as we followed and recorded their conversation.
I don't know if you guys can hear the sound of the video. Uh, I can't. I don't know why. Let me try again. Sorry. It might be because I muted YouTube. Of the video. Uh, I can't. Okay. It should work now. Yo, what's that window shopping inside Ford Foundation? Is that a jacuzzi inside a cubicle? I love it. It's Perk Space, an office furniture company. They make really cool cubicles. We should check it out. It looks like they have some wacky shit in there. Those huge volume volumes look like they are gonna fall on my head. Are they just stacking on one another? I guess so. Let's go check out that lecture over there. Sounds like that guy is talking about the history of cubicles. Do you also feel like there's someone watching us above? Let's do some Parker and go up to that sphere library. Careful, there's a gap. By the way, why is there a sign of no duck allowed? I guess they don't like ducky stuff. Yeah, I heard every cubicle they made is different. Let's go check them out in the showroom. Those look so fun. I want to have one for my office. You know you can talk to one of the designers to customize your own cubicle in the prototyping room. Excuse me, I would love to get a cubicle customized. Something cute but not too much. You know. I love your cute but not too much concept. I can take it from here and work on a prototype. Your cubicle is gonna be one of a kind. You will not be disappointed. I'll wait for you at the amphitheater. The cork seating is really comfortable and they are screening playtime. Cool, see ya. Watch out from that guy behind you with the crazy card. Office architecture needs to think with boundaries to support the leisure, instead of the superficial conservation of work leisure in open plan offices, in order to foster a healthy relationship between corporations and individuals. Perk space aims to provide occupants with sense of clarity and control of their time and action, and to create a new office typology where contradictory interests can coexist, where corporations, employees, and the public are simultaneously benefiting. I, I apologize. Maybe it was just me. I couldn't hear the end of what you just said there. Were yeah, other the people? Sound, yeah, I the couldn't sound hear was it. Not so good. Oh, yeah. Maybe you can speak closer to. Yeah, I can easily say it again. Um, okay. So we want to, in this project, investigate how can design environment help us escape the manipulation imposed by corporate culture, and we believe office architecture needs distinctive boundaries between work and leisure instead of the superficial conflation of work and leisure in open plan offices in order to foster a healthy relationship between corporations and individuals. Perk Space aims to provide occupants a sense of clarity and control of their time and action and create a new office typology where contradictory interests can coexist and where corporation employees and the public are simultaneously benefiting. Thank you. Mm. Look, I mean, I think it's it's a, a beautifully um, presented project, and I love at the end the video. I think that was uh, you know amazing to see it towards the end um, because it gives us a sense of like how how um, and 
someone might occupy or use that space. Um, so this is like, it's a facility for making cubicles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's amazing on so many different levels because I think it like tangentially um, starts to look at how we might uh, change um, the way that we work post uh, COVID-19 um, in a way where uh, cubicles we, we see are obviously going to go away. Um, and the type of way we work in a big city is also going <laughs> to radically change. But the interesting thing about this is that um, you know, these could be designed, uh, specified, and then tested um, in this amazing uh, kind of factory, like a factory-esque um, like kind of redefinition of the typology. But it would be interesting to like play out your, your narrative even further, um, you know, that you could be shipping out discrete cubicles that are distributed throughout the globe that allow uh, companies to be cohesive. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily need to be in the same space as, as, as the company. So there's like a speculative thread here that it's, it's quite interesting. Um, but I love the sense of uh, play and, and uh, kind of pushing through different modes of representation, um, you know, and to get at these kind of really unique uh, spaces, forms, um, occupation of those things. Um, but it would be, it, I think it would be really fascinating to play this out, um, you know, play out the fact that maybe this is not even a functional office. Um, it's, it's, at, it's more of a factory model of testing um, and, and shipping out uh, to distribute work um, outside of the city um, or a space that someone could work and connect to an office, uh, but not necessarily have to be in the office. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 it's a wonderfully um, kind of presented project. I hope you continue to work on this. Yeah, it's, it's like it is beautifully bizarre. Like, and, and I, I'm not sure if you were looking at like what you were looking at, like a Grand Bibliothèque uh, Nationale by OMA, perhaps. I don't know if you know that precedent project, the Grand Bibliothèque entry by 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 Rem and OMA. Have yeah. you seen that project before? Oh my God! Yes. <laughs> yeah, you have. Okay. So you know, the project is very interesting for me because I think you've actually placed this critique not only about kind of corporate culture, but you're actually taking the perhaps one of the most important unbuilt projects for maybe our generation. And you've actually then made it into a factory for making cubicles. So you, and for me, there's actually a kind of a doubling of the critique where you've critiqued a little bit about office culture and greed, but then you've actually taken the project that was the epitome of kind of uh, the poster child for avant-gardism in the 1990s and then you've actually made it to a factory for making cubicles. So it's in some ways, it's like a double, a double critique into taking what was seen as so important and actually realize that there's a corporatization of OMA's project that has been exacerbated through big and through other types of offices that have taken the project that was really interesting have, and have literally allowed it to be now the forward facing, uh, project for kind of new corporatization of public spa of spaces, right? And so I think that this, the, the what you've created is actually very interesting because I think it kind of helps to critique a little bit of our disciplinary histories also. Um, I do think that one thing for me in terms of representations, and I hope you get to this, because I think there's a project too, which is really about Instagram and about cuteness. I actually wrote down cuteness before you got to it, that there really has been a kind of a lot of things that like have dialed up cuteness. And I think in our age of social media, where everyone's trying to build distinction and trying to get some presence and distinction in social media, cuteness in terms of how things are packaged and, and um, captured as images and transmitted has really intensified kind of cuteness culture. And so I think the cubicles are cute, uh, but I think that they, how they actually live and how they're mediated. Like when you take an image of your cubicle, I think it actually has to be imaged in a really beautiful way. And so I think the back end of your presentation of actually showing people like get their cubicles and how they actually trans capture them, sit in them, take pictures of them and transmit them is also kind of part of your project. And I would like to see at the end, like, 
them leaving the factory and then kind of populating the world with these cubicles and how people can actually begin to produce and manufacture images in our culture and then transmit them. So the factory here is important, but the reality is that image culture is its own kind of factory for making images. And so I think that's kind of, I think is a kind of looming part of your project. I think what's really interesting, I, I'm curious to know if it was purposely curated these three projects together you know, one is like the 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 warehouse that's inside inside of a, a tower that's completely generic on the outside. The next one is a super playful form with color and everything. And like this one takes the playful, but it puts inside of a modernist thing that was kind of like in between. So I'm curious to know if it was if that was purposeful or not. But it seems like they there's some relationship between the three projects, but they're not quite the same, and they all kind of like aesthetically or formally come at it like a slightly different i i don't know is, is that intended or we want to know too yeah we don't know jason lee can only answer that question <laughs> it, i was just I just thought that it was kind of fun uh, how each one of these things, they, they took me on a completely different ride. And tonight I'm going to have difficulty sleeping because I feel like I've covered everything that I thought that I knew and I'm going to have to rethink it all again. And I've never, you know, I was never had a real answer for it anyway. But well, actually, if I could, if there is a, I, I could give a quick comment. Often when we do these organizations with all the nine studios, it's hysterical, by the way. Um, we just have these happy curatorial accidents. So, you know, we, um, you know, there's these, we don't, um, this is just a happy accident, Sam. So I'll just, you know, so hopefully that'll help you sleep better. <laughs> yeah. um, you, don't, you don't have to help Sam sleep. We like it better when he doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm curious to know if you guys are going to just automatically turn this into an actual business because I'm sitting in my apartment and I've been in here eight weeks now and I haven't been back to the office and ironically FX was in the middle of designing a new office, our own new office space in Brooklyn, which we're going to be in, we're going to be inhabiting, inhabiting this fall. And and now once again, everybody's just rethinking about how office space is going to be forever changed and you come up with this fun project and you kind of hypothetically joke about it being a, a business but um someone touched on it earlier about how you know this is this last eight weeks is really gonna make people rethink kind of offices in the city and like the things that we've kind of held on to for so long and frankly, I would love to order one right now as I sit in my apartment and can't change my environment. Um, anyway, that's not really a question in there. It's just more of a comment on the funness and the enjoyment of the kind of the three projects together that were, I guess, an accident. Yeah, I guess we've been thinking about this not also as a business for sure. We're, think, we're joking about making like products such as tote bags or whatever. But it's also very important that it's like sited inside of a public space. So there is this like on and off period where if the employees are not in the office working, if maybe the public can take over this whole thing and two groups are very essential to this project. So I guess um, the business side is also enhanced by the, the public uh, program quality that we're aiming to create. Then I would, I would throw out there that actually the, the design of the enclosure is really key. And so I think, you know, everyone's kind of playing with virtual backdrops now that we're like all in Zoom land all the time. But <laughs> if you talk about the, the, the cubicle in our, you know, now. The, I'm the partying. Yeah, exactly. The cubicle, the boundaries of the cubicle. I don't know if you've ever seen like a selfie museum. Have you been to selfie, have you been to selfie museum before? A selfie museum. You know what I'm talking about? A selfie museum? Where you go and you go to these spaces and you take pictures and there's these really kind of saturated backdrops that are really kind of interesting ways to take pictures of yourself and transmit them. I would think that the, 
the, the enclosure of the cubicle itself would actually do more too because you're placing a kind of objects and things in them. But you can imagine the cubicle, the surface of the cubicle, playing with the way that we zoom, you know, playing with the kind of like contemporary ways that we uh, look at each other and what the backdrop of the cubicle is and how it can actually begin to communicate different things and do different things. And that could also be, uh, I think, an important part of it. And because in some ways the cubicle backdrop is always so homogenous, it's so corporate, but a way for people to actually begin to play with that, exactly the way people are playing in Zoom land now with all their backdrops, is there would actually be a reimagining of the boundaries of that space too, which I think is also is a kind of great opportunity. So, I mean, selfie museums is the first thing to come to mind about how saturated that, that surface is and how it's playful. I also think, uh, I, I agree I agree with that, Antonio, and I also think that um, it, it is very relevant to where we're at now. Be beyond uh, beyond the, the backdrop, but further, um, it is very physically engaged type of um, investigation that, you're, that you've embarked on, whether it's for the cubicles themselves, which is the product of your uh, fictional uh, company, but, uh, but also the, the public space um, and inviting <clears throat> the public in through, uh, you know, there's this parkour part where you're climbing parts of the building. And there's a, there's a real, um, where we normally, when we go to our office and we sit at our desk, it's very codified the way that we sit and how we operate and our movement is very dictated and the architecture uh, as well as the furniture design um, describes that, right, and prescribes it. And, um, and here, I think what's really interesting is that there is an encouragement of exploration of ways of operating physically and engaging with the space physically that create this loop, right, between you and the space around you and how you might modify and change that space to reflect who you are maybe at that moment and then change it again next day. And these are things that I'm sure I'm not the only one, though I tend to be a little hyperactive physically, but um, but I'm sure everybody, you know, is feeling very, at least the first couple of weeks until we figured out what we needed to do and how much we needed to move. Um, you know, you feel very, uh, you, you feel like your body is in pain because you're sitting in front of your laptop the whole time, right? And you then realize that actually you were moving a lot more than you thought you were during the day just by doing the normal things that you do around the city. So I think this is a very interesting project and really relevant to our time now and hopefully to the future because I think that the worst thing that can happen uh, coming out of this uh, uh, COVID situation is that we are not able to learn something from it that will allow us to move forward in our day-to-day -day lives and in the way that we work and operate and interact. So I think there's a lot here, uh, both in the, in the fictional product and also in the way that you imagine this public space and routing uh, at the center of the atrium that um, it's very promising. I would look, um, you started to a little bit, but I would look uh, at other things than um, that have to do with uh, acoustics, that have to do with materiality. Changing of light is very important. Um, you know, it's a form of torture when you put people in a space that has absolutely no change in light uh, conditions. So that could be something that you could also investigate so that it comes very multisensorial. It's really not just uh, the, the, the geometry of it. I really, I feel like that's like a very important part that of what we actually learned from the project is um, the places we assign for leisure sometimes can seem like it's really good for working. So people may decide to go from the corporate office space because it's like all homogenous, the lighting is the same, into the leisure space be be because they prefer the lighting more like the softness mm -hmm. material there. Um, so like we, we want to think about how we provide this uh, option and the conscious choice of how they can begin to customize their work day because of those volumes and yeah. the control is in their hands. Can you um, one more time maybe describe how this is different than the kind of like contemporary Google office? Um, 
I think I think it's very important. We started by looking at uh, those corporation slogan of how you begin as an individual, but you come into our companies and begin part of a whole. And they kind of start to conflate this uh, boundary between individuality and collectivity uh, through the boundary between leisure and work. And for us, we wanted to make this distinct distinction clear by creating this di distinct boundary. So the leisure spaces are not inside the work work spaces. It's actually very separate and you know it's separate so that when you decide to make the transition, it's uh, you are very uh, aware of your, your action within this corporation. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, also... I mean, but then you sort of, but you sort of also just said that one of the important things that you learned through the course of this project is that typically, like considering the aesthetic differences between work and leisure, are no longer as relevant anyway, because we might long to work in places that you've now categorized as leisure spaces, right? Right, but because of these distinct boundaries, uh, you are not tricked into it. For, like, we 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 started by thinking how the corporate architecture using open plan offices can be kind of a manipulation of employees action because it's so um, it's so indistinctive that they can't tell if they're working or if they're in leisure but with us we wanted to um, make it clear so like you know this this space is for that this space for that if you're working inside of a leisure space it is uh, distinctively your choice to do so so you're not manipulated by this kind of office architecture, I guess. <laughs> and sorry, Ying, were you about to add something too? Yeah, um, I was going to say what fascinated us is this gray area that like office worker can also work in those uh, leisure volumes, but I would quote Mike on this for like to against something, we'll do more of that to against it. It's like we're exaggerating the current uh, corporate um, typology in order to like raise the awareness of this issue, you know. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm gonna confess that because I, I saw this project once, I think last semester for your final during the research portion. And I kind of feel like this is the second time you've outsmarted me or something, or the second time that I'm still not sure I get what's going on. Because on the one hand, I wanna echo the earlier comment that there's something insanely perverse and over the top about kind of both critiquing contemporary work culture. And then on top of that, critiquing REM, like through the kind of um, the, the Metropolitan Opera Project, like there's this doubling of like the kind of cynicism of the 90s coupled with the kind of like cynicism of the 60s looking at the office condition and there's so much cynicism that it seems so crazy to me that in the end we end up with the thing that just kind of looks still like google like this is no different than what any of the kind of like current uh play office scapes are. I mean, I think if you look closely at those plans, there are sanctioned areas, like there are typical meeting rooms with glass walls and a table and, you know, the table's at 30 inches and the chairs are at, you know, the properly sanctioned 18 inches. The ergonomics of those Google offices are not out of line with the so-called normative office space whatsoever. And I think that just kind of like re-spatializing play space versus workspace, it you guys are clearly too smart to be reproducing the logics of the thing that you're critiquing, but I don't see, uh, and I, I may have said the same comment during your last semester, but I don't see the punctum, like in the Baudrillardian term, of where you are cutting through all the BS and saying, we're going to expose the fallacy of this whole way of thinking with something else. Like, it feels like you're showing us the image of the thing you're critiquing, and then you aren't giving us any more than that beyond... Uh, I, I, I have to have to say I'm really glad that you brought that up because that, that's what I've been kind of thinking about this entire time. These drawings in particular were kind of got me because right now, if you look at like you know start Facebook bot, you know with 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 uh, Gary or KMV or any of the Google stuff, what they do is they have like a kind of crazy pot area where basically a bunch of people don't feel that they're working so much, and you know it, th there's a kind of maybe there's a cruel proof of the kind of corporate logic you're trying to critique that and trying to run away from it, you recreate it because basically you can kind of tell that, that all of these companies are like, nobody grows up and says that they want to be a square. 
like unlike in the movies there's not a guy maybe there is maybe there's like one guy in high school that like wants to wear a pocket protector one day but like most people <laughs> fancy that they are going to be you know fun creative independent people every single architect does and then every single architect becomes kooky in exactly the same way right and so there's there's something that where it's like every single company as it gets up to a certain size decides that they don't want to not you know be the kind of you know, they don't want to be evil. They don't want to be the big corporation. And so they hire a bunch of young architects to do crazy shit because somehow if they do that, then it means they're not kind of corporate behemoth. And so in some very funny ways, you guys have gone through incredibly creative lengths to sort of prove the MO, right? And I do want to say that that while saying that, um, it's it's really creative how you did it. And, and the thing that I kind of delight in on this project is the way that you treat the Ford Foundation or the cubicle, the two different scales is the found condition. So the cubicle is the found condition, you're gonna find a series of creative ways to subvert it and make it kind of, it's like almost like the architectural version of Dilbert cartoons, right? Like what are all the different ways that we can sort of un yeah. uncubicalize the cubicle? And you've done exactly the same thing now at the, at the building scale and the way that you're inhabiting the found condition, including the found condition of your own collage of just dropping these things in a box and having to live in what you make is great. But I guess if we accept the sort of actual analytical critique as the main as the main driver of your project rather than just the sort of formal play, it's I, I find myself almost dismayed because I'm like agreeing with everything you come up you, you say at the beginning and then turning around and kind of like you um, I don't know how to pronounce it Jeffer or Jaffer but, yeah yeah Jaffer um, Jaffer I just I, I I come to the exact same conclusion which is oh my god they've succeeded and like, Google would buy this like Facebook would buy it like this would be great like. But I want to I want to offer like a maybe really dumb and reductive and simple way out of the problem, um, which is if you were to take program and start with your program that everything at the bottom floor is is based on your you know fictional company parafictional company and they basically begin with this idea that everything's about the cubicle to the production of the cubicle the whole fiction is supported by what you walk into, but as you kind of circulate up through the building to the top floors, the kind of like nihilism of program and the slowness of like the counterproductive, which is your critique of late capitalism would basically turn this into a completely useless park that had no productive value whatsoever. And that like any person who entered into it, by the time they got to the top, they forgot why they were in there to begin with. And it would actually just be a company who's very basis was to make you forget the reason the company existed at all. And so by the time you work your way through its machinations, you basically come out the other side just, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter why you're there. It doesn't matter what you came in for. It's like taking Victor Gruen, if you guys reviewed the Harvard Design Guide to Shopping through this project, it's like taking Victor Gruen, the idea of like working your way through a mall in order to experience as much capitalism as capitalism as possible and instrumentalizing that as a tool through which to attack the very thing that you're critiquing right which is to say that like if we assume the office has some productive value let's create an architecture that's so convoluted that's so kind of extreme in its affect that like in the end you have no idea what it is and that becomes the actual mechanics of your company I mean, to me, like, that's like a really dumb off the cuff idea that I'm, I'm just saying, like, in looking at your project, but it, it does, like, that's the, the type of outcome that I would sort of want to see in a project like this. Not my idea, but the idea that you're taking the thing and you're really, like, putting it through a machine, attacking it, stripping it of all of its power, and then giving us something that elides. It's like a project of elision, right? It elides any, like, coherent or stable reading. I feel like I just want to respond by saying that some like corporations such as Google and Facebook, they kind of create this kind of uh, exclusivity that's essential to their collective identity. Like, oh, you're in Google, so you can enjoy this amenity. But by uh, injecting public programs inside there, you're kind of um, de denying that 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 identity uh, creating by these corporations. And I feel like. Um, fifty percent of the programs are actually not the office, but 
public. But you're not, but you're not actually making it a public space. Like I would then respond to you by saying, look at the history of pops, right? Look at the history of like a privately owned public space in the city. There's an incentive program across New York that basically forces corporations to open up parts of their offices, usually like a plaza at the ground floor for public use. Like sure, you're three-dimensionalizing that and you're bringing that up, you know, you're creating a more sectional experience, ironically, given that you're looking at the Ford Foundation, which already did that to begin with. But basically like that model already exists. And I think that by sanctioning spaces by your own admission as being very delineated, like this is public, this is private, this is leisure, you're not actually turning any formula on its head. You're reproducing a problem that frankly started in the eighties, which was to say that like corporations are responsible for giving the public public space. And that gives them also the power to regulate that public space, thus rendering it not public at all, but simply like an act of faux altruism. But maybe maybe the public here, I mean, now I'm, again, I'm just gonna keep going to the, the, this, this slide actually, thank you. Oh, sorry, this is my three year old again. Yes, it is. Um, I, I think the um, Hen did a, a, a factory for Volkswagen in, in Dresden called the Glass Factory. And the idea is that if you're going to buy a car there, you know, it's, it's for the Phaeton, which is like their luxury line. You show up, you get taken around the factory. Like you, there's this whole dog and pony show for you. And, it, you know, where you can kind of see the, like, you know, how the sausage is made. So maybe the question here is, is less that this is somehow subverting uh, the idea that these sort of pop-up pods or these sort of, you know, creative breakout spaces exist. But the innovation here is the idea that this actually becomes a form of entertainment for the consumer. It's, a, it's not actually challenging how the offices work, but actually how people shop. That, you know, like to, to, go, to go on the idea of the kind of Gruen, Gruen notion that the innovation here is, you know, imagine, I don't know, Google users actually have to go to Google, but it really, it's like, it's like a, you know, you could go to the Ikea offices or you can go to Knowles factories in, in, in Michigan or Knowles corporate offices and actually kind of have that sort of playground experience. So the, the, the publicness of, you have to pay to play. Like, again, the subversion here is that the publicness of this is that in order to become, to gain access, I have to buy. I have to have a people in mind that I'm gonna purchase. But I guess, yeah, that's kind of part of how we started thinking about this absurdity concept is um, for example, Ikea's showroom. The showroom is actually a public space. You don't really have to buy stuff to be, but uh, there is a motive that's hidden behind it. That's it's like a profit driven space to observe the customers. So there is this, like inherent absurdity in our reality that those contradictions are coexisting inside of one space. So I guess um, we wanted to express um, not really like preferring one or another, but how they are just both there. Okay. I would be very careful about how what you call public though. I mean, I hate to like go, I don't know, super lefty on this conversation, but like, you know, Ikea is not a public space. They are a private corporation who's allowed to say who can enter their building. Like you might very well be able to enter a, an Ikea and sit on a bed and not be harassed, policed, surveilled, or kicked out. But a lot of people can't claim that same level of publicness. Like. When private corporations own public space and operate public space, they're able to do whatever they want with it. And to call it public is an, a deep, deep problematic fallacy. So I don't know if, if you read like Mike Davis or David Harvey through this semester or this year, but I would really like look into authors who like talk about where, where and how public space is governed, policed and sanctioned. Um, I'm not saying this is all by the way, like I love your project deeply. I'm like so on board with the research. I think you're like the the cubicle diagrams are brilliant and amazing. And I'm only responding this way because I want to figure out how the project can achieve its kind of setup. And I, you know, I, I would love any other anyone else to jump in and disagree with me. Maybe it has in some people's opinion, but in my opinion, like, yeah, I, I as I said, it it's reinstantiating a lot of the problems that you're critiquing, and I don't see where the kind of escape valve is yeah. yet. I'm just excited to, to know that maybe there's someone else who's not going to sleep tonight. You know, you've been <laughs> even like very animated about this. And I'm just kind of joking about from like the beginning of the thing. And like what is so compelling about all three of these projects is that the rigor that it takes and that everybody puts into these things. And sometimes the real hope and the desire is to kind of end up on something new 
something new that's never been seen before because that's I feel like that's a fundamental desire of architects and artists is that to to really uncover the unfamiliar and maybe that was some of my trials from the the, the one prior to this is where some people were seeing something that I wasn't where I was like uh, it feels like some of these are familiar mechanisms and Jaffer Jaffer you're, you're feeling kind of like maybe maybe I'm putting words in your mouth but you're you're wanting something new here and and it's like that's the kind of desire that we're all trying to get to and it's super super hard I know I probably will never gonna get there ever but it's okay yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I think it's a great project. And I do I have a question about a little bit more clarity actually would sharpen the edge of the project. And for me, there would be one like really obvious way to kind of like sharpen the edge of it would be to actually take the cubicles, but there'd be an image where the cubicles actually like go and are distributed throughout the world. And someone's actually in the cubicle. And are they making, like when you're in a cubicle, cubicle is an office, like an office, a miniature office environment, but then people make things in that space. And so the question is, what do they make in that space? Do they make more of these kind of like balls and they start dropping balls like and they start creating things? Are they reproducing the diagram of the headquarters in different ways? Or you can actually see them actually creating like these kind of OMA type studies and like big studies where they're stacking boxes and rotating them. So they're, they're out there, but then people are making like new ver like versions of the factory that help produce the cubicle. Or are they actually then, or are they doing something that actually is about the space itself? Are they doing something quite literally that's obsessed with kittens? Or are they doing something that's obsessed with the environment that they've created? That would actually, those, the question about what they, the peak in that space would actually change the whole narrative. Would not change, would actually like, would actually strengthen two possibilities that this, the space is actually leading to a whole different type of work environment. It's about the cubicle or that they're there, but they're, they're forever cursed to regurgitate the same diagram we have learned again and again and again and again, right? And so then there's more about the kind of disciplinary history about the kind of cult of the kind of OMA diagram that all of those people, big, work AC, Rex, they all worked at OMA's office and they've propagated perhaps one of the most dominant uh, uh, types of thinking throughout architectural practice. And so what you're seeing for me, at least within one of those things is that here the cubicle literally is, rep is replicated and we see those things for forever kind of reproduced. And so uh, it, within either of those things, I just literally a final type of uh, way that you render the cubicle and its effect would actually suggest a little different uh, clarity about the, what the critique is. <laughs> But I would, yeah, I would make a claim that this is the clearest critique, this page that we're sitting on right now, precisely, and I, I suppose this is what you're saying, because like the OMA and its offshoots, all of those practices basically produced the diagram as a tool through which to leverage capitalism as a critical project, while also accepting the constraints of capitalism as a thing that was basically funding all of the projects, yeah. right? And that's why, like, to me, this is, like, fundamentally a kind of nihilistic project, and why, like, this slide in particular is so much smarter than any OMA slide, because it admits to the kind of, like, fallacy of the cuteness of the diagram, and renders it so absurd that it just becomes completely meaningless. And that's, like, right. where I see the power of the project existing. Right, you've gone so far, like, you've yeah. gone just to cuteness, like, forget big, like, I mean, like, there's OMA, and then the world of the diagram, like really accessible, digestible, easily consumable diagrams, and there's big, but you've gone like way past it. So such an absurd point that actually becomes a mere reflection of critique exactly. back on the whole project. Exactly, exactly. And that's why that, it, Sam, to your point, like I think that's where the newness of this project is. Like that's where it actually like achieves something totally um, kind of amazing. But then we return to like the, the, the problem of OMA, which is basically like, oh, well, we have a client and now we need to make this factory and the factory is going to house workers in this way. And you know, somehow it's like you got here and then it, it kind of pulled back into like the OMA project. Thank Not to overstate everybody. it though, OMA oh, sorry. wasn't the, oh sorry about that. I just want to say okay. that OMA wasn't the first person to subvert something. I mean, there, there, were, there were a lot of other people that were doing it all the way back into the 60s. I, I don't want everybody to walk out of this review thinking there's only only been one school in history that's ever subverted something. 
Very good point. I think that's a good point to end on. Um, thank you guys so, so much um, for reviewing all of the projects today. And I think there's some happy hour Zoom happening. Um, if you'd like to join us in congratulating our students and Hazel and Ying, amazing project. It's been a great year working with you guys. Um, always thought provoking and um, it was a great conversation. Um, so thanks everyone, take care and maybe we'll see you in a minute. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. It's good to see you. Bye guys, great job. See you in a minute, Ellie. Bye.